Trap Talk, Reptile Network, coolest reptile network in the world, episode 475, All in the Tree Tuesdays. Got my man, Coach Rice, sitting down with us tonight, but what is good, everyone? I'm your boy, MJ. Hope everyone's having a great start to your week. This is your first time hanging out. Welcome. All right? And then, of course, welcome back to all my fellow trappers out there. But if this is your first time hanging out with us, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, select all. You'll be reminded on every single piece of podcast that's dropped here on the Trap Talk Reptile Network. Uh, if you listen to Trap Talk Reptile Network on all the major audio platforms, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Wherever you listen to this podcast, thank you so much. It means everything. Shout out to the early birds. All right? Um, just want to say, dude, first and foremost, I want to go straight to the early birds. Who's here ready for tonight? I got to tell you. Tonight's going to be an amazing episode because my this guy right now that we're going to have on is somebody who's I feel like has been helping me out tremendously on opening my eyes to just looking for certain things when keeping a boreal species. But anyways, shout out to Simon in the building. Simon Pierre, what's good, buddy? Uh, all City Serpents. I mean, James, what is up? Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Heath and Hatchery. Epic episode last night with the homie Brian Heath and Hatchery. Uh, but shout out to the Pet Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. The homie Zach in the building. Uh, NW Herpetological. What is good? Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. The, the Fishy Plumber. What a name. What is good? Thanks for tapping in. Uh, Man Freddy, Morph Valley Reptiles. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. The homie Scott from Noble Family Fauna. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Uh, the homie Peter in the building. What is good? Europe in the house. I love it when I have a European trapper in the building. Love that. Uh, Trap Talk Be Global. He's a Patreon member all day every day. Big Mike, 1776 Exotics. The OG Trap Talk Patreon member. That's, that's a fact. The young hitter, JD, with his own segment uh, every other Friday. You can catch JD and Alvaro right here on, thank God, it's Colubrid Fridays. All right? These guys are going to be bringing the heat. Do not sleep on them. They just had their first episode last week, and it was a banger. All right? So shout out to the homie, JD. Uh, big things popping. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Scalpins and Feathers, homie Josh. What is up, player? Thanks for tapping in. Trap Talk Patreon member. Appreciate all you guys. The homie, Steve Doss. We have problems, man. Get the tables. It's Steve Doss. That's my dog right here. What's up, Steve? Thanks for tapping in. Uh, Trap Talk Patreon member, the homie City Exotics right here. It's my dog. Appreciate you so much. Uh, we're going to end it with the homie City Limited Exotics. And for anyone out there who's looking for exclusive content, if you want to get more out of what you see out of each episode, please look no further than joining the Trap Talk Patreon family. You can find that very first link in the description below. Click on that link. Join the Trap Talk Patreon family. You get connected to the Discord. There's an amazing Instagram group chat. Best way to connect yourself with some of the best student in the game, man. We even have some heavy hitters, a part of the Patreon family, man. Trap Fest 2024 happening in June. All right, all details are in the Patreon page and whatnot. So cannot wait to hang out with all you guys. But, man, just looking forward to just continue to grow with the Patreon family. So thank you so much for all the love and support. Uh, don't forget to support U.S. Art. Super important. All right, let's get to that. All right, second link in the description below. Click on it. Literally, don't be ashamed. If you can only afford a $5 membership, that helps. All right? So many of you guys don't have any US Arc memberships. It's crazy, bro. And I'm not here to single anybody out because there's there's just too many of you guys. But if you support US Arc, just literally, you'll feel better. Help these numbers go up. Become a US Arc member today. Thank you, Phil Goss. Thank you to anyone out there who supports US Arc and US Arc Florida. Um, Got to be on the same team when it comes to that. I uh, do want to say shout out to um, <clears throat> tonight's sponsor, and that's the homie Mark Hager over at Texas Condros. One of the best doing it in the Condro game out of Texas. My man Mark is on another level. I'm looking forward to seeing what he has to show for his projects this year when it comes to Condros, man. I mean, he has, he has had two clutches already this year, uh, but please go give him a follow. Follow this guy's work. You will not be disappointed. Texas Condros on Instagram and head over to his website, texascondros.com. See what he has available. Let him know that the trap sent you. He'll take extra good care of you. Thank you so much, Mark, for your support. And then shout out to David Brahms over at the Reptile Perch. Uh, Every perch you see inside my Focus Cube Habitat is a David Brahms design perch from the Reptile Perch. All right, so head over to the reptileperch.com. See what designs that he has. He has perch designs for your tubs, um, for any kind of rack setups, for hatchlings or grow ups. He has it all, man. I'm telling you, anyone doing it right is using a David Brahms perch. And he also is killing it in the Condro game. I believe he has four clutches on the ground, maybe five. I don't know. But best way to find out is by following David Brahms at the Reptile Perch. Okay. 
And again, head over to his website, see what he has. Thank you, David Brahms, for your support. It means a lot. You're, you're a big dog for sure. And that's a fact. Uh, shout out to my homie Blake <clears throat> over at Blake Exotic Feeders, number one quail feeder in the game, organically grown in his backyard. No third party access here. This is straight from the source. My freezer stays consistently filled with this man's quail. And it's all thanks to him. Thank you so much, Blake, from Blake Exotic Feeders. Follow him on IG and just hit him up. If you're like at that point in your life and you need that quail plug, this is your time, man. Go to Blake personally on, on Instagram, Blake, at Blake Exotic Feeders. Let him know that the trap sent you and he will take extra care of you on shipping and all other sorts of stuff. He's taking care of all the trappers, man. He just looking so, he's looking to lock in some, some uh, loyal customers right now. He's growing. He's blowing up. And thank you so much, Blake, for all the support. Again, Blake Exotic Feeders on Instagram and let him know that the trap sent you. Last but not least, shout out to Brian Susan from Sundown Reptiles, number one tree monitor breeder in the United States. Killing it on so many levels. And I'm so excited because I got something coming from him tomorrow. I'm not going to let you know what. That's, you know, personal information for Patreon info and big homie info only. But follow me on Instagram. I'll let you know. But anyways, Brian Tucson, Sundown Reptiles. He also works with high designer, Geckos, Abronia. Dude, this guy's really tapped into some amazing projects. All right. So thank you, Brian Tucson, for your support. And again, if you're just now getting into the tree monitor game and you don't know who Brian Tucson is, I'm help. I'm like, this is a huge like boost right now in who you should know and who's working with tree monitors in the United States and who's on another level with it. That's this guy, Brian Tucson, Sundown Reptiles. All right. All right. Shout out to everyone in the chats and it's time to bring in the big dogs. Yes. Hey, hey. All right. Look I'm at this. Going. There he is. Man, <laughs> no bill. I guess we're not talking about condos tonight. <laughs> no mayor. Too, too no. cool for emeralds. He, I think he's at a golf tournament or shooting, uh, late, or, shooting the yeah. frisbees or something. Yeah, he, <laughs> in Mexico, Mary, probably. Mary Who knows? To properly serve his constituents. hundred percent. hundred percent. He's either drinking wine or there's a fresh beer in his hand. Either way, I can guarantee it. Um, but listen, what's going on, fellas? Marshall, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I was doing great. Uh, you know, it's all right. Pretty low key. Uh, Come on, I'm going to, you know, don't make me just get straight to the question, bro. What's going on with your albinos? Are they alive still? What's happening? Yeah. So, um, of the, of the four babies that I ended up with, two of them had their first shed last night. One of them was not the albino, unfortunately, but both of those, uh, took a meal tonight, but right before the show. So the albino was, uh, you know, a little smaller than the, than the rest of them. It doesn't look like he's going to shed, but I, when I was feeding the other two, I noticed he was out kind of hunting. So maybe we'll give him a shot tomorrow again and, uh, see what happens. Okay. How many so fingers crossed? He, he's doing good. How many times? Still have you guys, alive. How many times have you guys dealt with a neonate? Not like shedding as soon as it has, like, have any of you guys had a baby that just takes forever to shed? Or does it, it happens? It like, happens a lot when they don't absorb all their yolk because they're a little bit smaller. You know, um, right. it seems to me that 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 those are the ones that uh, usually don't have a first shed with the rest of them. It can happen to other ones too, but those for sure. Hmm. Damn. What's up with you, Ryan? How you doing, buddy? Oh, just living the dream, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, and I like your shirt. Thanks for representing all day. Hey, no worries. I figure yeah. I better. <laughs> I'm still waiting for my merch, bro. What's good? When you oh man, I haven't had any made up in years. I gotta get back after it. So and Marshall is supposed to come out with a new draw a new line of merch from what I've heard. Um, not the same colors. I'm working on it. Are you working, working on it? On it. Like, yeah. You, you think you yeah. think by October, by October Tinley you'll have it? I hope so. By October. Yeah. Hopefully before then. You too, Ryan, just... maybe. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, well, I won't be at Tinley, but I know. Why you? But but you've been to Tinley, right? No, I've never been to Tinley. Really? No. Wow. Oh, we got to change that. Yeah. Well, you got to go to at least one. Tinley's not. I mean, I like to go herping when I go somewhere, and Chicago's not yeah. a bastion of herping. So. You, you ain't gonna be herping shit with some drunk people outside. That's about it. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of how it goes down. I mean, that's true. The only way I could get Ryan to come to Trap Fest this year is by setting up that little herping trip that we're going to be going on. So, <laughs> that's not uh, the only way. I would have come not doing that, but I figured with all that rain you guys got, maybe that magic gecko will be out from under the rocks and on the road. I, I got to look up what this magic gecko is. I have no idea what you're what you're talking about. A Swiatek gecko, barefoot gecko. 
It's like a big leopard gecko style uh, banded gecko in Southern California. It barely ranges into California. Dude, speaking of geckos, nice. I've, never, I've never found any geckos. Like my whole life living in San Diego, I've only found like alligator lizards and like other weird, like, you know, fence li lizards. But I found my first gecko in my backyard today. I couldn't believe it. It was. Which, uh, uh, did you find a bot tie? The, the, a, a crocodile gecko. No, this thing was big, bro. This thing is like this big. So like an introduced gecko? I think it got introduced. Oh, yes. not one of the two. I guess it's not native. Oh, okay, there you go. But it's we have the uh, Mediterranean house geckos here. Yeah. yeah, it's people thought it was that after I posted it, and they're like, and I'm like, that's not what it is. And then my buddy Alex, shout out to Panda Fonda, but he's like, that's an invasive species. I was, I forget the date that somebody introduced it here or something like that. Mm -hmm. But there was like, they weren't supposed to be here, but they're here. But I was like, holy, I can't believe I found this shit. Um, cool. Well, you fun. got three native geckos to your area, so. Well, I'm looking to learn more about it when you come visit. Because, listen, after that experience, I, I kind of want to find my inner Ryan Young. I think I'm ready. I think I'm <laughs> I I think I, but I'm probably going to bitch a lot, but I, I'm ready to, like, let's go out there, dude. Let's go. Well, I don't it. know. I don't, I've don't. i never even looked for – I've dreamed of looking for this gecko my whole life, and I've never done it. Uh, so, And they're really are real hard to find, apparently. So the chances aren't high, but – I figured you got all that rain, and I'm gonna be in San Diego. I'm gonna act, I'm gonna look. <laughs> all right, I know I'm where pumped. I won't find one, and that's sitting on your couch. Say what? I know I won't find one just sitting on your couch. So <laughs> no, be doing other things on the couch, but not not looking that's for right. geckos. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the couch, and then we go look for geckos. If that makes sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, but check it out tonight's episode, my man, uh, Christopher Rice. I don't know if you guys know chris at all um i mean i know he's he's a good buddy of mine because we talked back and forth he's helped me out quite a bit but also dropped some shocking information for me that at first i thought he was crazy but you know and also kind of making a little bit more sense because i've been a very big like advocate of spraying like i felt like spraying is something i love to do because i think the animal loves it right he's very anti that he doesn't think you need a spray at all whatsoever that even spraying an animal could actually cause stuck sheds um, and this all actually started from a conversation we had because I had a female that a, a big emerald female that gave me a stuck shed and I'm like, dude, I've been spraying this girl like quite a bit. Like why is she, why is she give me stuck sheds? And that's when he gave me the whole analogy of, you know, keeping your animal wet and then it going dry could actually cause it to give you a good shed. But what's your, before we bring Kristen tonight and drop tonight's guest, what is your guys' take as far as that goes with not having to need your spray or animal to, like have perfect sheds and to make sure your humidity is good. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I was, I've kind of been a long advocate for not spraying that much from the green Python world. Um, I don't spray that much either the green pythons or the emeralds that I keep, um, whether it's good or bad. I mean, I guess I could probably, I could probably successfully argue either way, but I do believe that, uh, if you excessively spray and you've got really hard water, you'll get like the water evaporates off the snake, but the calcium and all the minerals don't. Mm. And so those will stick to the scales and you can have issues that way. That makes sense. What about you, Marshall? I don't typically spray them directly. Um, you know, I just wet the cage down and I don't have any problems with shed most of the time, unless it's like middle of winter and i don't notice or you know let the cage dry out when the, when the heaters are all going in here but in the summertime um for me the 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 benefit to spraying them is they'll they poop almost automatically every time yeah. so um you know in, in the summertime if i if i have one that doesn't you know hasn't gone in a while um instead of soaking her i'll just take them outside and just turn the water hose on them and man, it takes like you know five minutes. They start moving around. They they shit, and, and you're good. Yeah, I take them outside, set them on the grass. I don't spray them, but and they usually just go right quick too. Yeah, I know they don't like to be sprayed. A lot of mine do like this tail whip thing when yeah. when the water hits them. Um, so I mean, I, I don't think they like it necessarily. Uh, but you know, for for uh, defecations, that's that's the main advantage as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we, that is the main advantage. Well, you know, this is speaking conjure wise. We all know how females can act a certain way, like when they're gravid and, you know, when there's stuff going on with them. And I've had my 
female sitting at her spot the way she's been wanting to sit um, prior to her giving me her prelay shed. And after she did a prelay shed, she went back to her same spot and there's a nice fresh water. And I noticed like, as I just was kind of spraying her area, um, she went down and started drinking the droplets right below her on the leaf. And I'm like, Oh my God, she's like, is she thirsty? And so I just kind of like slightly started spraying her and she instantly started drinking the scales, like started drinking the water off her body, even though there's a fucking big water bowl right there. And I've seen so many chondros or boreal snakes. Like as soon as you put fresh water in there, you shut the lights off. They go straight to that water sometimes. Like, and it's like, it's like they know, and I've seen her do that, but for whatever reason, she's choosing to take these little tiny sips off the, the leaves and off her body. Um, so that's why I'm like, well, fuck. I mean, that's why I think damn, if you do damn, if you don't sometimes like, I don't, I don't know. I, I've, I don't know what to say about like not spraying or spraying. I, I, I feel spraying is something some enjoy. Maybe some don't either way. I want to get to it tonight with Chris, man. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to bring him in. Are you guys ready to drop coach rice in, into the, into the mix? Absolutely. All right. All right, guys, it's that time. A uh, good friend of mine coming back to the trap, but first time on all in the tree Tuesday. So this is going to be epic. And he's been, making- no, he's, ho- he's hosted before. No, no, but this is first episode. Like this is about him. Oh, right? okay. Yeah, yeah, this is his show so tonight, right? And he's been, dude, quite the stir after the Ron St. Pierre. Um, oh, episode. yeah. He's been killing yeah. the memes. He's been killing it, bro. Like, he don't he don't miss, bro. And that's that's another <laughs> thing about Chris. If he believes on something, he stands on it. And that's, thank God, like, with the, the world and the hobby needs more people like that. So it's going to be a great episode. It's that time, guys. Do what you got to do to get your mind right. And do what you got to do to stay hydrated. Episode 475. Christopher Rice of Snake Spirit, a.k.a. the Anti-Spray King. Coming at you right now. Let's go. Cheers. Good. You ready for do do more in the future? Trap yes. talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only trap talk. Exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, God love it, love it or not. I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up Episode 475, Coach Rice, what is good, bro? Hey, what's up, y'all? What's okay. up, man? Good Ryan, to see you. Good you guys see you. all, Chris, yeah, Chris, yeah. You know the homie Marshall Mendez? Have you, obviously, you've been, he's, yep. been, he's been on the show before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were on with Alan, a, what, like a month, two months ago, something like that? Yeah. And Okay, and then Ryan, have you met Ryan yet? We've yeah. spoke on the phone, but yeah, yeah, never in person. Yeah, we spoke on the phone, like, I think last year. Oh, okay. ta- yeah, talked a little bit about um, chondro uh, maternal incubation. Oh, yeah. So yeah. we were both going through some of that shit. So. <laughs> oh, man, a little train wreck. Let's put that topic <laughs> on the shelf because we could definitely get to that today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That'll be a good one. But what is good, my man? How you living? Up, man? Thanks for coming back. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm looking forward to this episode for so many reasons. Um, and, and, you know, I, I gave you a nickname Coach Rice because, you, man, you, you're, you're a great help to not only me but a lot of people out there, you know, um, only just by sharing your experience. Um, it's not like you say that you're – what you know is, you know, is what the mm. – professional professional way to do it you just do it because you feel like that's the best way based off your experience and you know spraying man um why don't we just get to the point of your take with spraying your animal directly um how you know when you met when you've been following me i've been spraying my animals directly for a long time Mm -hmm. uh and i've remember i'd asked you what's going on with this stuck shed when i've been spraying this animal and you broke down that whole analogy behind spraying your animal and i want to hear that 
tonight, um, right now for everyone, if you don't mind breaking it down for everyone. Yeah, well, so in that in that uh, specific case, when we were talking about your female having a bad shed, yeah, I think, and understandably so, that and now you've added to it by calling me the anti-spray king. I'm not a hundred percent against spraying. <laughs> Yeah. It's I play around. It's you know I like to joke around. I like to talk a little bit of shit and have some fun with it. But I'm not completely against spraying. But what I see a lot is people that are really gung ho about how misting is the you know key to these animals' health, and that if you're not you know hitting them with fake rain all the time, that they're basically you know going to be miserable and they're going to be unhealthy and all that. And that's that's what really started kind of irking me after I started experimenting with not spraying a few years ago. So in the case of your female and what I see a lot, and I experienced it myself, you know, years ago as well, um, the specific issue you get with spraying is when you have your relative humidity, your baseline humidity is too low. Um, when you're putting the animal through these kind of extreme wet dry cycles where, you know, you're, you're hitting it with water, you're boosting the humidity up, but it's very brief. It's maybe a half hour to an hour that it, you know, boosts up to a, to a decent level. And then you got a rapid plummet, you know, then the snake's just dropping way back down to, you know, 20, 30% humidity. Um, and when you're putting it through that too many times, you're going to, I don't know exactly what's going on as far as physiologically, but you'll see worse sheds than had you just boosted the, you know, relative humidity up a little bit and not sprayed the snake. That's been my experience. And actually the, the thing that tipped me onto that was an episode of, um, I think it was unfiltered with Tony Nikolai and he mentioned that. And that's, that, that's when to me that made the connection because I was like, you know, I'm spraying these chondros and I'm still getting bad sheds, but my relative humidity was low at that time. It was probably, you know, 40%, something like that. And so, you know, I would do that multiple times a day and it's like, well, shit, I have to basically keep these things soaking wet all the time to shed. That just doesn't seem right. And so it was around that time, which was probably like 2020, I think. When I started, yeah, 2020, 2021 is when I just started focusing more on boosting the relative humidity more into the 65, 75% range as the baseline. And I started slowly backing off of spring. And then, you know, I'm getting animals that look like they're better hydrated than ever before. I'm having less problems with stuck shed. Um, and then, you know, just kept going kind of further and further from there to the point to where it was around. I think it was 2021 that I, uh, with my second chondro clutch that I was like, you know what, I'm just going to try not spraying them at all other than the very first day, <clears throat> because I figured if they, if they can go through the first, you know, that's what everybody's always scared is that first shed. You want to make sure you don't have stuck shed during that point. So I was like, well, let's see what happens if I don't spray them at all for the entirety of the first shed cycle. And they all shed perfectly fine just by keeping them over water and keeping the relative humidity high. A relative humidity, meaning the ambient humidity mm -hmm. in your entire room, right? What yes, and that's that's an important distinction, I think, because a wet environment's not the same thing as, you know, humid air. And so, you know, that's one of the things, like, you know, there's been debate a lot about keeping over water, and everybody's got different opinions on that. Um, I've been doing it for a few years, I think, well, four, yeah, four years now as far as babies, and I've had a lot of, you know, success doing it that way. Certainly not the first person to do it that way. I've just basically looked at what guys like Ed were doing and, um, you know, made adjustments to it um, for my particular setups. But um, the, uh, you know, the assumption, I think, when you're keeping the animals over water is that everything's wet all the time. And that's just not the case, uh, at least not in my setups. You know, the, the environment, their perch, the cage walls, most of that's actually dry, you know, uh, almost always. Yeah, that's similar to me. Um, you know, I, I don't. I, I, it's the humidity here most of the year is pretty high already. Mm -hmm. um, so in the summer, it's less of a problem. But uh, I, I would agree in that in the winter time, uh, you know, that's the only time here that it would drop to you know, like you're saying, maybe twenty, thirty, forty percent. Mm -hmm. um, in those cases, if you if you don't uh, if you don't do anything. Um, or you let them dry out at some point during the cycle, almost, it seems they're, they could be prone to have a bad shed. So that, 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 that coincides with what you're saying as far as the, the, you know, drop, um, and having it change on them. Yeah. And I think especially if it's happening like multiple times a day, 
You know what I mean? That's that's what you see. Is you'll see people that are, you know, blasting a um. You got the fogger turned on. What did you say? Got the the fogger. You know what? The fogger. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm I'm totally changing my mentality about foggers. Um, but the oh. misters are what I think are the bigger problems, like the the automated misting or even just manually doing it when you're hitting them two three times a day, heavy like that. But they're getting again, it's plummeting right back down to twenty thirty percent. Which I, I get that that's difficult, you know, depending on where you live, that might be hard for you to get your baseline a bit, uh, humidity above that, uh, at least in a, in a typical setup. But I think, you know, if anything, if I'm advocating for anything, it's not, it's not as much anti-spraying as it seems. It's more so just, you know, kind of rethinking a little bit about uh, relative humidity and, and, and actually I'm, I'm been starting to kind of put things together a little bit in my head as far as the potential that the animals are hydrating themselves through the air um the same exact way that the chameleons are wow do you um back when you were having trouble with those chondro shedding were you running heat panels as well yeah oh god don't don't start with the heat here we go here we go (laughs) i'm kind of anti-heat panel too i think we're probably on i think ryan and i we're probably on on the same page on a lot of things actually um but i i'm not like totally i don't totally hate heat panels but i I don't love them Um, i just wish they made like a six inch one or a four inch by four inch one you know there's ones there's there's ones on amazon that are designed for birds that you can get smaller ones um i've not used them yet but they're they're i think similar you know, I think yeah, it's I don't have a technology. problem with them other than the they make them so huge that, you know. I talked to I talked to Bob Pound via email at Pro Products a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he I think he said they had they were having some kind of production problem where they they make a, a pretty I say small it's like a maybe a three or four by nine or something like that because um, mm. the used smallest to make ones like a nine by twelve or something. That's what that's what I have. That's that's what I have in all of mine is nine by twelve. Um, but I, I I wanted them a little bit smaller, and he said they were having problems like produce, sourcing some parts right now. But they do make them. Uh, but he said it would be a while before they had any more. No, I thought he had discontinued that size. Mm. The only thing that kills me about the panel talk is because I I do feel like they're overkill. I feel like it's like it's way too much that that little box needs. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you know, too late. Fuck it, it's already there. So, I'm just, but I'm also using, I'm using minimal though. I'm like, I, I also like lowered how much these motherfuckers are actually turned on because I comes after listening to a lot of you guys. It comes to realize I don't even need that much heat with the way I have my room set up. My room already naturally gets to 83 during the day if I do nothing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So in a sense, I could almost is, turn them off. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only way I turn them on is when I need the, you know, like you know, I have a chondro that's gravid. Actually, I have two chondros that are gravid. And so I want that lower bottom to be 84. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that's where I have to turn it on. But also now I'm realizing um, that it's so smart to have every fucking one of these need to have their own individual probes. Like that's like an automatic thing, which I wish I would have done that a long time ago. Um, but I think that also helps you from having to run on everything when you don't need everything. If you just need it individually, it changes everything as far as like risk and energy i'm just so sick of my fucking energy bill i'm so over it like it's making me sick at this point um and now my wife like shout out to my wife but we're, we're this close to getting solar but of course she wants to match it to like four other companies and i'm like dude i i, I found the guy she's like nope we gotta we gotta look at other people and i'm like all right fucking so anyways sorry i had to just get that off my chest um <laughs> <laughs> but no but no i saw it's like <coughs> There's some truth behind like the panel talk, you know what I mean? Just like spraying, right? So everything has none of it's black and white. I mean, that's, right. that's no. you know, none of it's black and white. It's going to all depend on your setups, your you know, where you're living, what your, what the room is like, you know, all that stuff. I just never I I had two of the old Neodisha cu- cubes that that had them in them when I got them and um I liked them at first. They were all right. It just I felt like they get a little too damn hot in there for me, for my comfort. And I just felt like they dry the the cage out a bit. It's, you're kind of battling more with humidity that way. Um, but that was also I was running lower ambient at that time too. So I could have, like you said, if you're if they're not really pushing as hard, then you're not going to be drying out the cage as much with them. And so there's really just less less issues altogether there. Yeah, uh, no, there's no there's no hard and fast like yeah. what works, what doesn't work. I mean, mm-hmm. it's all you got to read the room. If you ask twenty year old, you know. 
we'd have different answers from 20 years ago. Oh, hell yeah. Just, I mean, you, we were you asked me long enough, it would have been a heat rock when I first started out when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, nice just give him a heat rock. Heat in it. Yeah. Light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The heat rocks, you might as well just put an oven. I went all the way it. back to the light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> I you, dude, light bulbs. I, I think light bulbs are are fine, and, and they, oh, yeah. they have, they're you know tried and true. Um, yeah, now, now, now listen, there's there, there's some light bulb like holy light bulb people out there who think like the old reason why. And this is mainly I forget the guy's name. I haven't, but I just don't want to say because I don't want to start shit. But there's a guy mm-hmm. that's in the Emerald Tree page who's like he goes pretty hard about why so many people have slugs um, and all this shit. It's because they use heat panels, and he's like. You got to use the the bulbs because that's the way they can bask, mm-hmm. as far as like the more natural way to bask. But what's your guys' take on that? Or Chris, if you want to tell me how you know you know who I'm talking about who who that guy is, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to be nice. I'll try to be nice. I, the only uh, reason why the only reason why I don't want to say his name because he's trying he's trying to like butcher the emerald the northern emerald tree bow at fucking market from what I heard, and I don't want to give this guy any kind of attention whatsoever. I how mean, do you, how do you yeah, do that? I, I don't want to even tell. I'll tell you after the show. I don't even want to say it on the show what this yeah, guy's plan is. I don't know. It's it's ridiculous. But anyways, go ahead. All that stuff's pretty silly, but yeah. Um, no, I mean, I th- I think, uh, and I don't completely disagree with everything that guy says, even though I, you know, I'll just be honest. I think a lot of it is bullshit. I, I think that there's an there's an element of truth to. I think probably basking under, you know, certain kinds of heat is you know going to penetrate their their tissues better than others. I don't personally know if that's true with heat panels or not. Um, I would think the closer you get to it, you know, uh, being close to the sun would be best, but that's just kind of common sense. But obviously to say that, you know, they don't work at all and it just causes all sorts of problems is basically to say, you know, anybody who's bred emeralds and has had plenty of successful litters, you know, that it's all imaginary. It's like, you know, who, who hears, you know, I, I'm, there's plenty of people that have used heat panels and had successful litters of emeralds and lots of other animals. So it's not, again, it's not a black and white thing. Um, I just personally, you know, with, when it comes to heat panels, I, it, they're just not my preference. Um, I'm trying to use the sun as much as possible and, and move that direction for everything that I do. But that's yeah. I can't do that in every room yet. I mean, but the truth of the matter is you do see a lot more slug to live ratio when it comes to litters in emerald tree boas like you yeah you see that kind of success unfortunately it kind of comes with the territory but like i always wonder how can we do less slugs like what is it that we're doing um to even have a female slug out <coughs> or, or only give us one live or two live and then like 10 fucking slugs you know what i'm saying yeah well that's a, it's a tricky question and i don't know i certainly don't have all the answers to that yet i'm trying to to you know see what's working over here I've had pretty good success with a couple females, and hopefully this year I'll have more, um, you know, keeping them the way that I've been keeping them. And I'm inclined to think that what I'm doing is is better than what I was doing the first time around um, in terms of how I'm doing heat and how I'm doing their basking. But I don't know that really for sure. Um, but I've had pretty decent success. I mean, I've produced 30 babies so far Nice in the last few seasons. Um, from just Three, few- right? Last three years? Yeah, the last three years. And then, and you know, but I've had, I've had two really full litters that were, you know, basically, you know, near perfect. Um, and then I've had two that were one, one that was totally bunk, one that was okay, and another that was like half decent. Um, yeah, but the difference is in those, you know, the, the, the interesting thing, again, it's too early to say, but the, the litters that went really well were in that back room in acrylic cages where they were they had you know sunlight penetrating through the the uh, acrylic and they were basking like that daily constant fluctuating ambient temperature overall warmer uh higher temps than than most cages um get but for shorter periods of time so um the cage you know the the setups where the females didn't have that grade of litter um i do wonder if it was you know to do with the uh the, the heat and uh, the way that was all kind of working. So, go ahead, Marshall. Uh, I was just going to say uh, the the couple of two of the Bateson litters I've had were same pair, same cage, same everything. One went uh, incredible, and the mm-hmm. other one was terrible. And the only, I mean, same, you know, uh, so who knows what it could have been. Well, that's you the know? other that, that's the other element to this is that you know all we can really do is try our best to get as much of the parameters dialed in as well as we can, but there's always the element of timing that 
you know, whatever little things didn't go quite right um, that are out of our hands, you know, you can't really totally control that. I don't think there's going to be any kind of methodology that's going to end up proving out to where, you know, 100% of the time, every single time you breed northern, you're going to get a full litter and every baby's going to be perfect. I mean, that's just, you know, we can't replicate nature that closely, and I doubt that even happens in nature. Yeah, I was going to well. say, yeah. You know, but, yeah, but I mean, I obviously we want to improve. Great... Like, what was that? I haven't had great success with northerns. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people haven't. You know, it's it's it seems to have been pretty problematic for a, a lot of people. Yeah, I only got two babies out of three litters. So. Do, do you guys think that's because so many people start with with imports, or it's because I I do agree. It seems like uh more you see more people having success with basins. Whoa, you get, see that lightning back there? We're getting some. Not to get some mm, hellacious some, weather. Um, <laughs> um, man, made me lose my train of thought. Uh. <laughs> Come on, come on, Marshall. Get together, bro. Northerns versus basins. I think there's more right. basins produced oh, in yeah. the U.S. every year yeah. than oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just bred northerns. So, I mean, I wonder if that's because Shit, like, people are are using captive bred babies, you know? Like, there there just seems to be, you know, more his, more, uh, uh, history's not the right word, but there, you know, there's there's people that have got, I mean, a multiple, multiple ca generations of captive bred now. I mean, there's not that, you can't really say that for northerns. No, you no. There's not been that many people. Others, oh, there are some. There's um, yeah, yeah, a few. There's definitely a sure. few, but there, it's not. Yeah, it's not on the same level as as basins for sure. Um, you know, and that's definitely you know that's one of the things that uh, that kind of irritated me about some of the new like overnight emerald expert stuff okay. going on in the community, where it's like you know the claims that like nobody's had any success with emeralds and everybody's doing everything wrong. It's like, dude. It's a list of people that have had pretty damn good success with basins. It's just Northerns has been a little bit of a challenge. And, you know, that's, um, I've, I've been having pretty good luck with, with Wildcott Northerns so far. I mean, I haven't bred any second generation yet. So everything's been Wildcott up to this point. I mean, I've been told that, if you, <coughs> and like, you know, I don't know this yet, but I was always told if you go from raising a United States captive born and bred emerald, Take your time and get that female. There's normally no problems from from captive hatch stuff. I don't know that. I mean, Ryan, the stuff you had success that was all imported stuff that you had paired up, or what did you pair up that? At no, that? Uh, the female that I got the two babies from. Um, the first time I bred her, she slugged out. Um, the second time I bred her, I got two babies and slugs. But she's captive, and, born and bred, or was she? A yeah, wild she was produced by Rico. Oh wow! Okay, cool. All right. He killed it with Northern. He, he yeah, had, he was, yeah, he, that exactly. Re, yeah, he, he did was. A lot. Yeah, wow. he. You know, again, that's he what really irritated me about the Northern. Like at the end, he was. He was, he was cranking him out for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, and are we talking like good ratio numbers as far as per litters? Like he was getting like big litters, like or or just a lot of females were going for him. Both. He yeah, like probably he both. Good litters, big litters, lots of babies. Well, and. Babies. And in Europe too, you got there's. Um, I'm probably gonna, you know, forget names or, and I apologize if I butcher them. But I mean, there's like um, Andreas N uh, Nyman or Neiman. I can't remember. I think he had four really good, strong Northern letters last year. Um, really? Yeah, and then you know there's Magnus Settervind. Magnus, um, yeah, he's got killer, killer that, stuff, man. Um, and then Glenn awesome. Bogue. Glenn Bogue has had, you know, that dude's got one of the. He might have the best Northern collection in the world. I don't. I, I'm. It's put it up against anybody's basically um so there's people doing it and there's people that have been doing it but it's just a lot of work yeah magnus has got you know those look, are, look how nice that thing his is are man. some I, of the I, best man he's I, got oh, yeah. the best ones i've ever seen i thought I'd those like that. are those second or third gen willie i can't remember willie line. those are like next, second next gen third third generation i think I third think gen yeah next generation so i think this is the third generation that he's done yeah so his stuff is yeah it's super dope i mean he's and he does cool setups for his too. Like I like that he he does things a, a lot of ventilation. Like mm -hmm. he has a lot of ventilation. And his his are like I don't think he does bioactive, but they're kind of natural. They're definitely naturalistic setups. Right. Um. You know, it's a little different, and it's working for him. And I mean, that's you know, there's there's more than one way to do it. Obviously, where's he at? He's in Europe, or where's he at again? I don't. He, Some, he's in, I don't somewhere in exactly Europe. Yeah. He is. Yeah. I've Have never spoken with him. Of... I've just admired all the stuff he's done, and you know, yeah, commented back, back and right. forth a bit. You say, Ryan? Have you guys heard of anything about like captive bred male northerns not being good breeders? 
I haven't yet. My, my mail's got the job done. This, I mean, got my my Miss Willie really line. I knew a few people who raised some up and could never. I had a captive bred male that was huge, and he would never go anywhere near. I mean, no was, it lean? was it lean or pretty big? Was he a, was he a, was he a pretty big one or was he like lean? No, he was big and lean, but and he was he was like ten, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, and just never did anything with a female. So you know what's crazy? One of my best emerald breeders was a male that I thought was a female for a long time. So like I was assuming this female as I was feeding it, not getting as big as I thought it should get. And then I, you know, Socrates came down and he actually helped me probe everything. And that's when I found out, holy shit, like this, this thing's a male. And then I was thinking this thing's going to be a terrible fucking breeder probably. Dude, this thing's a fucking beast, man. That's why I don't really understand. I don't, not that I don't understand, but I don't really go with like, oh man, you got to keep them so lean if you want them to be good breeders. I don't think that's always, I don't, I don't think that's always the case. I mean, I think you could feed your, your emerald male appropriate sizes like you need to not have to worry about keeping it lean or feeding it sporadically um i don't know i feel like a good fed fucking male could actually get the job done because i've seen that with ball pythons too and other species where they eat pretty well and they're fucking still great breeders so i don't know about that whole like let's keep them kind of scrawny or like athletic size or however they want to fucking call it i don't know I think generally it's probably more of a recommendation just to not have them be really like big, you know, fat slugs Overweight. essentially. Yeah, yeah. To where they're just like not, you know, if they're constantly backed up with, with feces and, and hardly moving, then yeah, they're probably not going to be a, no, a they should be shitting. That's the thing. Like I always feel like, you know, the shits are, I always go off shits. I really do. Like if I, if I'm like, damn, this one hasn't shit in a couple, like, you know, a couple meals or a meal or two, I definitely won't push the envelope. I'm not mm-hmm. somebody to keep feeding it if it hasn't shit, because I only think human wise, how would I feel if I haven't shit and I just keep feeding myself? That has to hurt. Like, that has to not well, feel good. You know, worse what I mean? for them too, because we don't, I mean, we can, we can lounge pretty comfortably. They got to wrap around a perch all the time if they're, but we don't know how that feels though. That could, like, true, you know, true. But I mean, it, you, you can, you can see physically if, you know, it looks more awkward when they're, trying you know if they if they're really you know full of shit it looks more awkward when they're wrapped around the perch than if they're i don't know i don't know, know how they, i don't know i don't know how they sleep like that You're, i'm sure you guys seen your emerald like almost with like knocked out with its mouth open and they look so comfortable on that fucking perch and and they're <laughs> huge you know what i mean but it's crazy how they could be like that for a long time um and this yeah, the other real skinny perches too i've you know seen the gravid females curled up on you know they just a wire times yeah, a lot of times they prefer, you know, I'd put try to put different size perches in there, but they'll go for that really skinny one a lot of times, and it's like, it's got to be comfortable or they wouldn't be doing it, you'd think. And what's crazy to think behind you, you know, and a lot of your enclosures have options for real skinny perches, huh? Like, you don't... You don't these aren't, them. yeah, these don't have super, super skinny ones just because of the big adults, but they're pretty, they, ha- they definitely have some thinner options. And um, for the babies, I, you know, I use the really, you know, almost like wire fencing. Now I noticed crisscrossing, right? And mm-hmm. I and, and I feel like they utilize that to kind of lay on top of them sometimes. And do you think that's important, especially for a gravid female? I do. I think do, and I'm trying to move more of mine towards that. I, I want to add more crisscross stuff, and they like the like kind of like forked, like yeah. a vertical fork, like something like that, yeah. where they'll they really seem to do that. And a lot of times, um, they've kind of moved the perch around. But if you can see there. She'll perch. They they seem to love to perch where they're kind of up diagonal. Yeah, you know, like, they're curled up and yeah, like that. They yeah. a lot of times will do that. So I'm trying to add more crisscross to that. And um, you know, I'm always tweaking things a little bit with the setups, but um none of these setups are really permanent, so I'm not I haven't gone like full out with, with the different perching. So Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, they definitely, you know, they prefer the variety and they, they prefer it. And with the gravid females in particular, when they have a lot of crisscross perches, then they'll sprawl out sprawl all sorts out of different ways you know yeah and i think that probably helps you know in terms of uh, as the babies are developing it just keeps things safer you know what i mean yeah and what's going on with you this year marshall i mean you have stuff paired up your emeralds i know you were showing some stuff no no time. no emeralds uh both my my uh, adult female basins i lost them so i've, I've got well, females, i thought you just lost the one well, the one that was gravid, but then earlier in the year, I had I had another uh, the a sibling to my really nice male from Steve Volk had a like really bad prolapse. Oh my god! Yeah, she was she was better than the male too. She was like six years old, coming up on you know just prime, prime ready. Jesus, talk about gut wrenching. So, yeah. 
so so i mean so on that wall that i visited what's left as far as breeder females go because you have that you have a you have a hybrid female right or no yeah okay i have, I have a, a hybrid i've got actually two <laughs> two two hybrids two hybrids <laughs> and uh fucking good. two hybrids and uh um uh, uh, the male basin but they're not paired up <laughs> no no, they're See, not paired up. All right, there you go, Ryan. They're not paired up. You should be happy. Actually, I have a male basin and a, and a male hybrid. Ryan's not happy unless they're dead, right? Is that what it <laughs> <That's> is? <right. laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Um, and, and, Ryan, I know you uh, – so it's been two years since you had that success from that litter, right? At the, and you only got two – you said you got two. No, it was, last, it was 23 last year. Oh, it's last year. Um, yeah. and, and how many – you get out of that two? Or remind me? Yeah, or? I said two. I produced five basins in 2013. Um, oh wow okay and then i raised one of those females up and i loaned it to a friend of mine and uh unfortunately she retained all of her babies last year and so does she like and she ended up rolling or does she no she actually is back eating and looking fine but you know she probably can't breed i have a northern that kept her babies too is she and any of them come out at all uh the re she i pulled three out um because like I went in there and it was like she should have already had them, and I knew it went too long. Like her head shrunk in and her back got all real bad looking. And uh, then I was in there one night, and there was the tail of a baby hanging out of her. Oh, and so I I grabbed it and pulled and pulled it out. And luckily, when I pulled it out, it pulled another baby partially out, and I was able to get that one out. And then I. Uh, I got she got I got a third one out. I think it was about a week later. Um, she had it had gotten down close to her cloaca, and I kind of palpated a little bit of the baby out and then pulled it out. But and I the, think she still has two in her two or and three. The female, the female during this time is just kind of like letting you do your thing, huh? Like it's like it's almost she needs. It's almost she was like appreciating the help in a sense, or what? Uh, I you know she didn't enjoy it. I mean I can tell you that, but. Sure. She was not a particularly mean snake, so she tolerated it okay. But she eats. It's been uh, what three three years since that happened, and she eats and she's fine. And I mean, she'd be a good pet for somebody. I'm debating about if I try to breed her or not. I mean, I'm sure it would probably be a train wreck. But I mean, I went through my very. I went through my first prolapse. Uh, I will overduck prolapse, right? Um, mm. And I, you know, I, one of my biggest things I always feared is like, you know, retain eggs is I always feel like it's instant death or you have to go to the vet and do all this, but really you don't need to do all that. I mean, it kind of has a way of, of it's taking care of itself in a sense. Right. Um, or, or, or like, what did your guys go to with a snake that you guys know that is um, retaining eggs or, or a litter? I mean, you guys don't go to the vet, correct? No, I, I've started, um, you know, I remember hearing, I went on, uh, and I think I talked to him about this on the phone too. Like with Ed, you know, he he used to take things to the vet and and you know try to get something taken care of, and a lot of times it still goes south anyways. So he's he's moved to that, just kind of letting letting nature take its course and and letting the, the female pass it naturally. So I've had a, a chondra that retained a few eggs. I think it was in twenty one or twenty two. I can't remember. 22. 22 i remember that yeah and so she passed those eventually naturally on her own and she had retained them for you know two months close to that i think something yeah. like that um and then i had my friend actually my friend had uh either last year or the year before had a um, suriname red tail that she gave birth and we didn't know that she had um retained any babies uh, but I was actually taking her, care of his collection while he was on vacation. And it was like similar to, situation to what Ryan, what you were just saying. I went in, you know, I went the one day and I look in the cage and I just see it's a mess. And I'm like, oh, this will be fun to clean. And then I looked closer. And I'm like, oh, shit, there's a, you know, half rotten baby hanging out of her. Yeah. So I ended up having to palpate and pull, pull two of them out. And um, then she went another, I think another month after that and passed two more of them. But they're just like mummified. They're they're. I mean, they're nasty, but they're they're not like a normal kind of rot process of what you would expect to see. Were they they were covered in that like calcium stuff? Yeah, they were weird looking. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to remember the ones that there was two. One of them was pretty pretty messed up. It was it was you know looked like it was partially decayed, and another one was more um, that you know looked kind of like that. It had just grayish white crap all over it, and uh, but it, you could you know it looked like a pretty fully developed baby. 
And, um, you know, I was able to get those two out. And then I think the next two looked similar to that. I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember the pictures offhand. But, I mean, that snake's been totally fine ever since. And she didn't even act like anything was really wrong before that. Other than, if I remember correctly, she stayed, like, she was looking abnormally dark until she passed all those babies. And then she kind of returned back to her normal, well, you know, her, her kind of baseline coloration. But, I mean, I've got an Amazon that has passed past two um in the last i don't know six or eight weeks and uh she had her litter like a year ago mm -hmm. now the the yeah. one the, these snakes that are passing are, are they eating for you guys is, is or are they not eating at all no they and i think yeah. that's they, what they, needs to happen i think they need to eat right that's kind of the important part is to ensure that they're eating right I think so. I mean, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't hit them with super huge meals. Yeah, but, not you, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I pretty much just when Lucy the chondro had, she had a few in her. Um, I just fed her like normal, and she just eventually passed them. I actually tried some huge meals, hoping it would uh, move the babies yeah. along, and it didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would have been a little concerned just if that would have caused you know anything to to become backed up further. But yeah, probably not. I mean, it's. I, I sometimes with these animals, I think, you know, not that you not not to neglect them, of course, but sometimes the kind of helicopter parenting that we can do sometimes probably doesn't. Really they almost do that thrive much, on maybe. neglect sometimes as, as opposed to to, you know, yeah. feeling like Calculated you have to get in there and do something, you know? Yeah. Letting letting them do what's going to come naturally, I think, can, can, you know, of course, there's always exceptions to that, but I think overall that's usually the best best, best approach to those situations. Yeah, I've had terrible luck with uh, taking them in for uh, to like to the vet for retained days. It hasn't happened many times, maybe twice to me. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't happened uh, in the last couple of years, but both of them, you know, vet went in there, did you know, did surgery to extract. I've had a pretty much a zero percent success rate with any snake that's had surgery so far. Um, yeah, seems to be everybody I know that's had a snake cut on, it's dead. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, that seems to be the case. So I think if it happened again, I would be just inclined to just let it, you know, whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of that, as far as um, <coughs> that female that had that retained egg for you, that chondro, Chris, what, what's mm -hmm. her breeding lineup like? Are you going to breed her again sometime soon, or are you just giving her a long break, or – I well, tried pairing her. I, I tried pairing her up this season, and she. I, I think she locked with the male. I didn't really observe any, um, you know, direct locks, but they were courting. Mm -hmm. But then they actually got in a fight, so I had to separate them. And every yeah. time, yeah. And I mean, she's 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 mean. She or well, she can be pretty mean. So yeah. she she whipped around. I you know I'd put him in there. Um, they had already been paired. I took took him uh, apart and fed her, and then whenever I reintroduced is when you know, the fight went down. Thankfully I was right there because I mean, they would have, you know, she's pretty big. She would have probably taken them out. Um, yep. but uh, I was able to separate them pretty quick using that little, you know, that corn cob tail. Yeah, thing. Cob. I don't, I don't bite them. I you just pinch them. Just, you don't yeah. even have to bite, just pinch on the tail. And I separate them both really fast and thankfully without any serious damage. But, um, so and I've, I've gone to put them back together, but she's actually she acts aggressive every time. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to, you know, hold off a little bit, try him again. So I don't know if she'll go or not. Um, I'm leaning towards probably not just based on, you know, I haven't seen anything concrete with her, but um, I don't, I'm not scared of trying. I don't, I think she'll probably be okay. Um, hopefully I'm no, not they, eating my words there, but I don't, you know, we'll see. It's amazing what they, they can still reproduce after trauma, like losing an oviduct. Yeah, they exactly. Still reproduce. Yeah. yeah. Or, or even after you like getting their ass beat. Like I just literally about three weeks ago, I had a male fucking idiot who like was perched right next to this big monocory female that I had. And of course, like I'm feeding the other snakes and they're just like, their heads are like, like they know it's in there. And I'm like, God, I'm trying not to walk by them. And of course, like I, I walk by as far as I want, as I feel like I need to. And that male just strikes at the female and that female wraps the male mm -hmm. and i'm like oh here we go and they're on the ground rolling i take them out and they are so tight on each other it's like and i'm like dude this this is bad and you could just see the the male just let go and just like like almost gasp for air i'm like dude she's choking this dude out and i fuck, i just that's why i, would, I went in there i was like i, I can't let this happen it's yeah. like I, I went by the tail started fucking with them she started loosening up um let go of the guy 
and dude i don't have you ever seen bruising on a snake before dude this fool is completely bruised all right it's like gray like his whole body side of his body is gray which is basically just his scalation like you know it's like a black looking uh, have you ever ever seen a bruising on a snake before yeah the scales get screwed up yeah uh, from like, like a rodent bite or something Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, but yeah, this is a fucking big chondro bitch bite, man. This this girl did work on this dude. Um, so, anyways, after so that, what's what's the, what's the trick? You grab it, you you pitch the tail. I th- that area is very sensitive. Um, I, and all I, I didn't bite it. I'll tell you that much. But I went down there, and that's when I started kind of I started wrapping from the tail. Um, and then, hand and sanitizers, the key, man. That nothing gets them to drop shit like hand sanitizer. Like what, in, like in the probably. mouth or what? In the mouth or what? Yeah, you you put it on your finger and then rub it in and then just barely touch them at the edge of their mouth or by their nose and they will instantly. Yeah, I bet, they yeah, freak. Yeah. That's I good to know. I tried. I tried a couple years ago with the same female. Got in a fight with a different male, right. and um. Say, you know, it was similar to the situation where you were talking about. I walked by, I, I couldn't, I had the cage covered. I actually just lucked out that I heard the thud. Right. Like I walked by and I heard a thud. I'm like, that didn't, something sounded weird about that. It didn't sound normal. Yeah. And so I looked in, I'm like, shit. And, but they were, yeah. they were going at it. And, um, I had tried, you know, spraying a little bit of alcohol. Some, I can't remember what liquor I had tried doing next. I've heard that, you know, was heard that. I've tried dunking things that worked in the past, like years and years ago, but it just wasn't getting them to go. And that little corn cob technique, when I dealt with it this time, it's the, I think the original technique came from like a um, Indonesian yeah. farm or something, right? Like a, where they do it with big berms and retics. They actually bite the tail right. like right. right on that. But what I just did instead is just take your fingers and your fingernail and just, you know, if this is the tail, just apply pressure yeah. like that. And it's like instant. They just both let go. And as soon as I did that to their tails. So I got them separated within a, a, trick, a year or two. Like or, I mean, pit, within a minute or two. Like, it's like that trick they do on pit bulls, like stick that thing up their ass and they fucking, they let go automatically. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but we're, I was going to ask you something as far as, fuck, um, we were just talking about, what were we just talking about right now? Chondro fights. Oh, yeah. So, But what was crazy is after I ripped this male off the female and everything they went through, I paired him up with another female. He fucking locked that female in five minutes. Mm-hmm. So after he just got the living shit beat out of him, he, yeah, um, he, he went right back to work. You know what I mean? He so, liked it. Yeah, he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some people, some people Maybe he rolls that way. <laughs> I know a guy. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, yeah, but anyway, so you know, right now though, Chris, what is the importance of your whole entire, I guess, collection, you know, cause I know you're like almost a little bit of uh chondros and emeralds, but like, what is it that drives you every morning and, and, and evening? Like what, 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 what's sitting in your head nonstop? Is it more emeralds or chondros? It's the emeralds. Yeah. I, it, it became pretty clear over the last couple of years, just because I noticed anytime I would, you know, be looking at a chondro or thinking about buying a chondro, and I'm like, oh, I kind of want, you know, this, this locality or whatever. And I'd end up buying an emerald instead. And that happens so many times. And I'm like, I keep just buying the emeralds and not the chondro. So I think this is, you know, where my, where my focus should be. And they've just, they quickly became, you know, my favorites. Um, I still love the chondros and I still, you know, I'm working with them. Um, even though Ed's always teasing me, he's like, when are you going to get rid of those things? <laughs> you know, but, um, but, um, but yeah, the emeralds are definitely my focus, you know, my, my primary focus at this point. So, um, I might trim down a little bit on chondros just because of space, but, um, but I still want to get in, you know, there's other locality chondros I'd like to get into eventually too. I love the, uh, Marukis. Um, I'd like more Aru's. Um, I think I'm all right on Biox for the moment. That's mostly what I have. Like red, um, like red neonate Biox, right? Uh, I, <laughs> Actually, no, I, I, I've been a, um, yeah, Ryan, you'll be appreciative of this. Now, the majority of my Biox are all yellows. And I've wow, been, wow. Yeah, I've been a, I've been a yellow Biox fan. <laughs> you got no, like, t- peas and carrots, peas and carrots. Uh, no, wow. I know. I, I've been, I've been tooting the horn for the yellow Biox for a while. It's a pretty lonely road out here though. So um, well, I just don't understand why people don't have both. Like it just, it I know I'm the way. same way. It's I, I like the reds too. I, I love, yeah. I, I just happen to like a lot, you know, a lot of my favorite chondro species or my, you know, my chondro locality stuff has, I just noticed a while ago. And even with some of the designer stuff, a lot of what I like personally are yellow neonates. Um, but I, I, you know, I've still, I don't know, Chris, too. let's be honest. You just recently posted one of your BX 
um, probably the dirtiest Biak you have, and that thing's fucking fire. And I know goddamn well that thing's not yellow. It's a red. Yeah, and, I know. Okay. It's a red. But I love the yellows, too. I love the yellows. As well. I feel like you're like, hey, listen, come on, man. He got third and fourth place. Like, he's he should hang out with us, too. <laughs> no, dude. Like, he's not. Like, no. Like, like there's, like, a certain demographic to what we're talking about here. And yellows are just, like, they're on the back of the bus, unfortunately. Like, on the shorter bus, you know? No, I I, I really, I genuinely think they're dope. Like, I I, I like the yellows and the reds, even, you know, pretty evenly with the, uh, with the Biox, even. Um, I just don't, yeah, I, I, I'm with Ryan and that I don't, I don't get why you can't just like both, even with the designers versus locality. It's like, you, I don't, I don't understand why you can't just appreciate both. And there, I think there's more people nowadays that do, you know, like they're seeing the value in both. Well, it depends what you're I think people just like to talk shit. Well, that's oh. fun. Yeah. And I do, I'll, I'll joke around about it too. I mean, well, it's I just think people just don't shit. like green pythons is what it is. I think that's, they, I mean, that's just true. Python people parading around and that is true. It is true. There's a lot of people that don't, that's like the worst outcome they could have is if the baby green tree python ended up being green. But that's not their yeah. fault. It's not our fault that that's our influence right now. Like when you go into the green tree python world, what do you see? You see amazing designers that are all coming from red. None of this yellow stuff. Unfortunately, there's a little. No, bit but of- I'm talking about just adult snakes being green. Period. Like just oh, uh, like green. what Ryan's yeah. saying. Like it, there's just doesn't seem to be as many people that actually like a green green python. I do. <laughs> like- They're cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. They're all feeble-minded people chasing the same fucking. But well, I don't know, Ryan. It's kind of. It's kind of. Yeah, Ryan's in a different position because he has some crazy, crazy locality fucking looking green tree pythons uh, that aren't just out there. Like, there's a lot of stuff that you show and flex off when you're pissed off, Ryan. Um, it, it's not available, bro. Like, that's – and I don't know if that's the stuff that you just – because where you got it from, um, I don't know. But I, I, Listen, I love what you work with, Ryan. It's, it, it's Well, I put in the work. You know, it, it didn't well, start exactly. out that way. Right, okay. Yeah, your ruse are fucking – those are super dope. Those are yeah. No, where, and, and where are we at with your? <coughs> how are your arus looking this year, Ryan? What's going on with your chondro projects this year? Uh, I got two pairs of arus going. Um, one female, I'm pretty sure, is done, and uh, the other one is still breeding. So we'll just done. see how it all goes. Done as in done. she like ovulated and she's like yeah, old. yeah, yeah. Okay. Done as in something's gonna come out, good, bad, or otherwise. So. Yeah. I'm very superstitious, man. I don't like to talk about my chondro stuff. Hey, because honestly, how many times have you guys had a chondro, like a female, like get gravid and you didn't really see any locks, but it went down? I haven't seen that yet. I just one for me. I, I had just this one and done. And it, you know, it, it, I don't know if that was why the cause of the poor success. I don't think so because there were, you know, seven or eight good, good uh, eggs and full term babies, but. That's been my that's my only experience with it. Um, I hope it happens for me this year because so far I haven't had shit. <laughs> That'd be cool. I've had a few pairings where I've only seen a couple, you know, locks. So yeah, it's the the conjures have not been super active for me this year. I don't know. I, we talked a little bit about that MJ before. Like I don't yeah. know if I started pairing them a little bit later than I should have because the emeralds all were going earlier for me than than ever before. Mm. But the conjures something something's been different with them. So we'll see. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because here's the thing about this, right? I mean, in, in a sense, if you miss a window, mm-hmm. that next window comes pretty frequently, right? Like not frequently, but it comes like in like 90 days or something like that. Or like how would that work in a sense, guys? Like, you know, you have a female that typically would cycle in December or, you know, in late in February or whatever, but then you miss that window. Can't you just keep it paired and something could possibly happen later on that year still? Potentially, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what I'm trying with right now with the ones that I've paired together. If I haven't seen a lot of action with them yet, I'm just going to keep pairing them and, and, you know, see how it goes. If they go six months, seven, eight months with nothing, I'm just going to go ahead and separate them, you know. But um, I figured I've had that with emeralds before where I put them together in, you know, November. didn't really see anything until late January. And then it was like, boom, everything kicked right in. But this year, like I said, everything with the emeralds was starting way earlier and, you know, I uh, already had the one ovulation. I think the other one, second female, is probably going to ovulate any day now. Uh, no, not not behind me. It's in the other room. But um, White Rose ovulated a few weeks ago. 
And that's the earliest I've had an emerald ovulate so far. So, But White Rose has gone for you before, right? No, first time with her. Oh, wow. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. And that was like right after mine, right? Like mm -hmm. when, when Yeah, just a few weeks, I think. Because yours, yours, yours had her POS, I think, just right before March uh, mine ovulated. Something March like that. 3rd. Yeah, March 3rd is you when. You guys it's... don't have enough snakes if you can name them. <laughs> not all mine are named. Not all. I stopped naming yeah. mine, though. So I, I, I mean, I. Most of mine have IDs for the for the. Man, the it blows my mind listening to these green python guys talk about all these snakes by name. I'm like, what the fuck? Well, here's, here's Cherry Top. <laughs> Cherry Top is a. Oh uh, my god! I'm like, I can't. Rem I can barely remember my kids' names. Like, I sure as hell can't remember somebody else's snake's name. You know what it is? Though? I get tired of referring to stuff by IDs, and then especially if I'm talking to somebody else about it, I I, I don't like being like, what? you know, for a while I'd always be like the the surname one, and then it's like, well, I got multiple surname ones, so what? Mm -hmm. Now I got to set. It just gets old, so I try to give them names, but. Well, yeah, I, think I, I just don't though. talk to enough people about that stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so, I'm too secretive <laughs> myself. So. Well, I mean, a, a lot of it too, though, these people are buying snakes from sires and dams that have names too. You know what I'm saying? So it's mm -hmm. kind of like the name thing kind of just continues in the designer world, which you have no clue about, Ryan. Respect. No, I don't have a clue. So, you know, go I'm, ahead. I don't know shit really either. I, I hear a lot of the names and. It's not as insane as the ball python stuff. My friends about yeah. breed balls. I can't keep up with that horse shit. I, I, gave, up, I gave up with that about 15 years ago, too. If you name your ball pythons, I want nothing to do with you. That's for sure. I, no, I, I mean, I can't keep up with the combo names. Oh, yeah. That I'll, stuff I'll, sounds I'll, so crazy to me that I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a whole other world. <laughs> we don't have to go there because we'll start losing people. Um, I will tell you this, though. <laughs> I will it's basically you. like the designer. <clears throat> same shit. I want this to be on record, though. Chris, are you saying are you not doing any red to yellow type chondro pairings at all? Are you going to stick to true? No, yellow? no, no, oh, I'll, no. I'll, I, I, I would love to see it. I mean, I had a, I had a mixed clutch of BX in 2021. That was the first time I hatched some reds, but of course they died. So <laughs> they died wow. like, yeah, within a, a, I think within a day or something like that. Two really badass ones out of that clutch. That was the that red female Sophia. The really dark, yes, you know, dirty fire. one, and um, to a yellow male. And I'm trying, I'm trying to repeat pairing that, you know, now, but I'm just not seeing a lot of action. So, so she's given you a clutch before, mm -hmm. and 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 then last year, I sh last year she maternally incubated four infertile eggs all the way to the end until I pulled her off of them. So okay. that was super weird. Really? Wow. Yeah, I, super weird. I remember weird. that you did. You were mm -hmm. documenting that whole like process, and I, I remember yeah. love seeing the stories. Um, can you break that down? What happened again? Like, can you tell us what all what, what went down on that? Yeah. So she. So so with maternal incubation, I've been trying that right from the very first chondro clutch in 2020, and uh, I've been mostly fucking it up every time. But I thought I think last year it worked pretty well, except for the fact that the eggs were bad. So basically, she you know she went in the box. I think it was about three, you know, two three weeks before she laid. I don't remember exact um, time period. But she would like went straight into the box. They used a bird box with you know sphag dry sphagnum. Everything was set up pretty well. It was you know um, low 80s, you know 81, 82 ambient. The box itself was measuring around 84, 85, and uh, she seemed to be comfortable with it. She went in there, you know, did her thing. She laid. She was beehived around it, nice and tight. And I was just checking her about once a week. Um, you know, I just filmed just for a second to check on her. I didn't, I didn't ever count the eggs, but I saw, you know, the first one or two times I checked, I saw, I could see eggs. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, there's a clutch there. And then it got to like day 53 or 54 and she's just still wrapped around them. And I'm like, well, this seems way past when you would expect a maternally incubated clutch. So I eventually pulled her and um, there were just four bad eggs, you know, that she had laid. But it was, what's interesting is that she was on them. It was like, it seemed like she just... Because they were bad, she never got the cue, you know, whatever biological cue tells them to, you know, uh, unwrap them. Um, most likely when the babies start pushing around and start trying to pip, she just never, it's like that cue never came. So who knows how she would have, actually, how long she would have sat on those eggs for. And I've tried talking to a few other people that have had similar experiences and no, none of us really have an idea, you know, why they would do that. But I think birds will do it too. I think it was Bill Hoffman I talked to said he's, he's seen that with some birds that he's bred. Where they'll just sit on the eggs indefinitely, um, you know, sit on bad eggs until you pull them, basically. 
Did so. she ever go into shed? That's weird. Yeah, she had it. She had a uh, prelay shed. I mean, after because I typically notice my females will shed about the time their clutch hatches, and I've always wondered. And that's across oh, okay. the Python spectrum. Mm. And I've always wondered if that's Mother Nature's cue for them to, you know, time to leave. Oh no, no, she didn't go into a shed cycle right then. So yeah, I don't know what's up. It's just I just thought it was very weird that she sat there, you know, throughout the entire period. And I mean, I'm, I almost wish I would have just left her for a while longer, just to see how long she would have actually gone, if there would have been anything that got her to to finally leave or what. But um, to me, that, yeah, I could be wrong about it, but it tells me that the setup, hopefully, was at least suitable for maternal incubation, to where it would have worked better, had they been viable eggs. So I'm gonna, you know, if I get a clutch again this year, I'm gonna try it again. Um, I'm just going to keep beating my head against that wall until it finally works well and so I can be Glutton for punishment. satisfied. It. Yeah. yeah, it's just, that was one of my goals right from the get go with breeding chondros. Is like, I just want, I want to do maternal incubation as the preferred method. And so, I mean, I royally screwed it up the first year. That was a total, total disaster. I did salvage the eggs, but, you know, the, the setup was, was terrible. Um, just basically messing with her way too much and changing things on the fly. And it was, it was a disaster. But, um, yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully if it works out this year, I'll have some success with that. And Ryan, you also did not have a good experience trying to do maternal, right? You that that kind of went down the shithole for you as well. I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. no, the very first time I ever tried maternal, um, I, the female that I was using, uh, she didn't like anything in her nest box. No, no moss, no nothing. If you put it in there, she wouldn't go in her nest box. Um, and so she laid them. Just I had like a two gallon bucket. And she laid them in the bucket, and uh, she was doing great, like great beehive and everything. And then I just noticed, uh, smelled, and so I pulled her off of them, and one of the eggs on the bottom had died. Mm -hmm. And I figured it might be because that bucket didn't, like if it had been wood, probably would have been better. But I think that bucket didn't allow any of like the, you know, when they lay them, they're kind of sloppy. And then I think there was just nowhere for that to go. And the so bottom you, one do, you, do you think maybe if you drilled some maybe holes at the bottom of that bucket, that would have been different? No, uh, probably not. I mean, she would have had to lay it right on there. Um, I just think there was buildup of humidity and stuff from the laying process and just it killed that bottom egg. And you could see where it was just kind of killing other eggs. And so I, I saved the eggs that were on the top that weren't in contact with the the dying egg. But And then the other three times I've tried it, it's... Yeah, it's been uh, interesting. That's Got crazy. That's crazy though, because you you know a lot of people who like, for instance, you put eggs inside a um, an egg box, you incubate them, right? You notice one bad egg going bad, but typically the other ones don't go bad. Like they they usually that one egg goes to shit, even when the other ones are touching them. Like when they're all bulked together, some people who prefer not to rip them apart, leave them together. You see that you have other of the chondro neonates hatching out, and the bad ones are just still there, attached, completely dead. Um, so it's crazy how in that, you know, in that kind of scenario, that bad egg doesn't kill anything inside that egg box. But when it comes to them being coiled inside a female or over a fe uh, under a female, <coughs> it, it's yeah, the other I way. don't I don't leave dead eggs with any clutches. I don't. You just pull them, right? Yeah, I. I, I I won't say it always kills the eggs next to them, but it overwhelmingly has an effect on the eggs next to them. Yeah. And now I've seen with the maternally incubated stuff, I've seen both. I've seen yeah. eggs that, that went bad that didn't have any impact, and then I've had ones where it looked like that ruined a couple of eggs and actually got the, you know, was what I think probably made the female leave. Yeah, so I've I, seen where slugs don't seem to affect the other eggs. Mm -hmm. or an yeah, like with dry egg slugs. That looked good but wasn't fertile. Mm -hmm. I've seen those shrivel up and not really affect, but if it had an embryo and started to develop and then yeah, it died, right. that seems yeah, to be the difference. I don't know, man. I've, I've had those kill stuff next to them. Yeah, I had that. Yeah, definitely had that with the maternal clutches, and and um, I've salvaged. You know, the I, I succeeded with maternal incubation in twenty twenty one with a biak, although it wasn't a total. I, I don't feel it was a total success because she. I wanted to see the, you know, her still wrapped around the clutch with the them pipping, but she left. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it seemed like as soon as the first one pipped, she was she was just done. She she must have been the hell done with that stuff. So, um, <laughs> but um, but I've had it where I've salvaged the, the all the other clutches I've had. I had to salvage from you know failed maternal incubation attempts, and um, 
I've seen it where it looked like the female urinated around the eggs to try to boost yeah. the humidity, I assume. Um, and that a couple with, with the one female that succeeded in 2021, she had done that and it didn't kill the eggs uh, because I found urates in the nest, uh, you know, right next to the eggs. But then the other time it seemed like it, it, you know, several of the eggs got wet from that. And I'm thinking because it was a plastic container, maybe similar to what you had, it just couldn't, you know, couldn't escape from that. And they ended up going bad. Um, I'm going to try to stick with wood, you know, the wood bird boxes for now when I try again, because I think that's, that seems to have, you know, worked pretty well when I tried it. And I know that other people in the past used those to pretty good success, but, um, yeah, if I could get more damn chondro clutches, you know, I would I'd have yeah, the last... to experiment with, but I've just been focused on the emeralds, and yeah, that's kind of my fault, honestly. I've just been too focused on the emeralds and not really giving the, the chondros my all. Yeah, the last two maternal clutches I tried resulted in two babies from one of the clutches, and I think the females were just working too hard. But they were, I was, I, the clutch was probably like 82. That mm-hmm. was the ambient that they were at, and I think the they all the babies went full term. None of the eggs died, but they none of them hatched, and they oh, yeah. never loosened up. They were just choking the life out of those eggs, trying to keep oh, them. Shit. And so I have a feeling if I would have had them like eighty five, eighty six, they mm-hmm. probably would have been fine. But that's what I'm trying to aim more for. I did, I did when I did have success in twenty one. It was lower. It was like eighty two, about you know on average. But again, it was not perfect. She, she, you know, left the clutch. And there were a couple of eggs that were, you know, there was one fully formed dead in the egg. And then there were two, um, you know, that had deformities with the jaw, that little weird, yeah. you know, cleft lip thing. Uh, but I don't know if that's a genetic thing or, a, or a, you know, if that occurs during the development process. But um, so wait, so Chris, you did it. You you did the uh, maternal incubation with the ambient heating that you did, so that you didn't you didn't apply any kind of like supplemental heating at all. No, what? Well, when I there was still they had heat um, in twenty one. It was in one of the Neodicia cubes, but the nest box was uh, on the opposite side of the heat panel, so it was on the other side of that. So it wasn't you know getting heat from that. So the ambient in the cage was about eighty two during the day and about eighty at night. I just did a very slight oh, wow. uh, night drop. And then, um, but I've heard, you know, I had heard a few different suggestions to kind of bump that ambient up a little bit more, like 84, 85-ish. <laughs> so that's what I tried in, uh, tried last year. And um, like I said, it seemed, the setup seemed to work. I mean, she stayed on there, you know, she didn't, she didn't leave them. There were, weren't really a lot of problems, except for the fact that the damn eggs were no good to begin with. And um, That's crazy, considering how often they kick out the, the slugs, you know? That's what it's- was weird. I would have figured she would have just left. And I mean, I don't know if they were fertile at first and crashed early and just didn't weren't problematic. You know, I, I've I've kind of wondered about that with slugs. Um, I I don't know enough about it to be sure about this, but I, I feel like with slugs in general, but particularly with boas, I, we always refer to when you see some kind of a slug like, oh, that was absolutely unfertilized. Um, but do we yes. always know that? Particularly with boas, do we know that it was definitely unfertilized, or yes. did it just crash early and we you know we say it was unfertilized? You can at least python eggs. I've if you let a slug sit out a while, a lot of the time they try to chalk up, and then if you cut into them, you can find evidence that they were fertile. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now, I mean, overall, when it comes to this year um, with the emeralds, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm curious. At what point do you feel like it's not necessary to have your males paired up with the females anymore? Like, you know, when you, when you don't see anything kind of go in the distance. Well, right now I've been lucky in that they've, I think everything is hopefully going to go the distance that I've done. I've done three pairs. So I've, the pair with white rose already, she already ovulated. Um, the anaconda face female, Big Dottie, is, um, I think she's going to, you know, ovulate basically any day now. The male. What did you, the, what did you breed to her? Uh, and same male that I bred to the other one. It's uh, just a young, it's like a three year old, or I guess it's approaching probably, wait, I get him 21. He's probably approaching four years old now. Um, really nice young Suriname male um, that sired one of the good litters last year. So he bred two females. And then I have the pairing here, which is a repeat pairing. Um, anaconda face female and normal male. And they produced a good strong litter in 22. So did you get, did they produce some anacondas out of that, out of that litter? Yeah. 
yeah well yeah so what I, that's the, the whole anaconda phase genetics thing is interesting um and i don't fully understand it i don't know that anybody does but i i had a conversation with glenn bogue from um oh god why can't i think of his, the i can't think of the name of his company right now but he he has a really amazing um anaconda phase collection in europe and he he explained to me that he's produced anaconda phase from you know anaconda to anaconda anaconda to normal and then anaconda to what he refers to as anaconda phase uh sibling animals and that you get different amounts of anaconda phase in the litter um depending on what the pairing is I wonder so if it's, it's like a like an incomplete dominant thing or or well no probably yeah it seems like or maybe it's recessive I don't, yeah, it's, it's weird because, and, and there's, there's with anaconda phase, you see animals that have, you know, some of them have a fair amount of white still. It just almost looks like it's a reduction of white and that can kind of vary, uh, quite a bit. You know, some of them have almost no white at all, essentially others will have, you know, very, very little, or they'll have a couple of little blotches, you know, random blotches of them. And then the patternless, you know, that what I would consider to be patternless animals, looks like it's almost the same kind of thing in that they have a varying amount of, uh, of actual, you know, um, random little blotches that are left. And then you even see that, that thing that, that I have, um, one of the babies that came out in 2022 at first was confusing to me because it looked like a half and half, like the front half looks anaconda, the back half looks, it's actually pretty high white. Mm. So I'm like, what the hell, you know, I didn't, I hadn't seen one of those before. I've seen since pictures of a couple others that look like that. And then I've seen patternless animals that looked half and half as well, where they have, you know, the back half is, there's essentially no pattern, but the front half looks like what you would typically see. So it's a little confusing with the genetics, but I, my expectations are that with this pair, it'll probably be similar results where I'll get, you know, a few anaconda phase, a few normals, um, so are they when they do have white? Is it always towards the head or the tail, or is it vary? It's throughout the whole body, and it varies a bit. So mm. the I produced there was two anaconda phase babies that came out of that litter: um, one red neonate, one green neonate. The green neonate looks a lot more like what I, I think it's going to look very similar to the mother, like uh, as far as the tone of green, and she has you know very very little white on her at all. The red neo has a little bit of faint white in in the markings from head to tail uh but it's very very faint and um and the shape of the pattern is a little bit different it doesn't look as like anaconda you know pattern as um as the the green neonate now if that has anything to do with it being a green versus red i, I have no idea i just haven't seen enough of them to know um it was so a, we'll it was see a, what the other one does well no neonates being orange even sometimes like like and yellow sometimes. Yeah, man, that's fucking intense. I haven't I haven't had that yet. Um, but yeah, I mean there's there's um Tony Nikolai had a litter with, with some really cool looking yellow ones. I've just seen pictures of it from they were old pictures. And then um orange, I don't I can't I know I have seen it. yeah, there's a few people I've seen that had more kind of like pinkish orange uh neonates. And um I don't know exactly what's up with that as far as the you know the the genetics of it or 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 much i haven't experienced it here yet i've just had reds and and greens primarily reds tony nikolai hasn't had any northern letters in years right like this is like years back in the day when that was old pictures i saw those were probably 20 or 30 years old yeah i I don't i don't really know i don't think he does but i I don't know i haven't talked with him um Mm. i'm just going by the the old photos but those yellow ones were really dope looking, and I believe, if I remember correctly, those were from some kind of an anaconda phase pairing. I don't remember if it was, you know, anaconda to anaconda or, or anaconda to normal. All right, I'm um, gonna get to a topic that's gonna be juicy. <coughs> I hope you're ready for it. <coughs> yeah, hang on one second. My throat's a little bit dry here. You guys, I promise you, Chris is not dying. He's okay. He's good. Uh, <laughs> he likes that <laughs> misting water. <laughs> Got my good old drink. fake rain here. He's, he's, he's drinking <laughs> the air. <laughs> Don't dry out, man. Don't dry out. Oh man, you've been saving that the whole show. You've been, just, been. just waiting for the perfect just waiting for a good opportunity. Just to, yeah. To, yeah. Shit, yeah. Man, man, I'm just it's just awesome. stupid. Just it's just dumb ideas <laughs> pop in my head and they're fun. Or at least I have fun. Uh I, I've come to you like a friend many times for advice. <laughs> And you've been there for me, my man. Um, but let's paint this scenario real quick, and I want you to be real. Um, okay. 
What do you think of the statistics if I were to tell you, hey, Chris, I dove in pretty heavily in the Northerns, bought a shit ton of fucking about 30 Northern imports. 18 of them have regurged. Um, but I think I found something, and I think they're all going to be fixed. What would you say to me? I would say good luck, but I would say that there's, you know, this has been come up, you know, quite a lot in the past as far as different solutions to that. And so far, you know, this is, this is shown to be the, the same outcome every time. Right. Uh, people have tried to feed, you know, hairless rats as a solution, uh, really tiny meals, uh, you, you know, can only eat mice or can only eat rats, one or the other. Um, you know, I, I don't, Personally, I, I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll try to be a little bit, you know, understanding about it and say, all right, well, maybe, maybe uh, it'll prove out to be something where, you know, you can get them on the right track again, and maybe some of them will survive. But I, I just don't see how, you know, that particular incident um, or that particular issue, you know, if we're just being honest here, talk, talking about the the fruit diet thing, I don't see how this wouldn't be affecting everyone else's, you know, collections the same way. Um, yeah. You know, as I was far as the impression that the regurge thing was an avian disease that they were catching in the hold. Well, exactly. I mean, most, there was a guy, you know, that, that just posted about this. Um, I can't remember who, what his name was off of hand. I think it was Nacho. Um, I think he's from Europe. He had, you know, he had posted results from the animals that he had that have regurged. And they were all they all had uh were positive for chlamydia. Oh god. Yeah, I thought it was some which kind is, of yeah, it was avian animal. chlamydia. Which is in the in the past what you know everybody had heard about and and um you know everybody's experience with that in the past has been the same thing. So, you know, that's why I was really careful and in, in going slow with my you know, acquiring my collection. I never bought more than one or two at a time so that I could quarantine them, you know, in multiple stages. And, um, you know, I passed on a ton of really, really, really good looking animals that when I looked at them, I'm like, you know, and especially if you, you, you know, try to get a response out of them, just looking at them, it's like, I've seen enough animals back in the day working in it imported where you can see that kind of weak tone and weak response. And I, I just passed on them if they looked whack. Mm. So I, I, you know, I don't, uh, I would be freaking out if it were me in that situation as far as that. And I've had a lot of guys, you know, MJ, we talked about it a little bit, you know, I've had people that have, I believe tried to flex on me in the last couple of years with like sending me messages like, Oh, I just went out and bought, you know, 25 wild cotton northerns or whatever, or 30 or 40 or whatever. And you could tell it's kind of a flex, like, Oh, I'm going to show you. And it's like, all right. And then a year later, the whole project's mysteriously, you know, gone. So it's I, like I, first thing I tell somebody because <coughs> I because people hear how I talk about, <coughs> how about import northerns all the time. Like you got to be careful. So whenever anyone mm. picks up a northern import, they instantly want to message me and saying, "Oh man, this one I I couldn't pass on this one. Look how flawless this thing looks." And I'm like, "Wow, okay, that thing looks like a, like it's it's an adult. Okay, what are you feeding it? Oh, I just gave it a mouse. Motherfucker, feed that thing a real meal, okay? And let, and and once you feed this thing a real meal, come back to me and see what happens." I never really hear from him ever again after that. That's kind of when it just kind happens, of happens happens all the time. Go away in the wind because guess what? These things can handle big meals. Trust me, I fucking and they handle it. them and they can handle them immediately. No issues. No issues if if they're good. Now they can handle not, them. Yeah, they handle them right out. of I mean, I I know it's going to sound crazy, but I honestly feed them full size meals straight away first day I get them. You may as well find it out. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, that's what I. That's what I don't. I, I don't fuck around with them. I give them. I give them a full size meal immediately, and the majority of the ones that I've acquired have eaten. You know, either the first, either the first night or within the first few days. And if they're not in a shed cycle, if they're in a shed cycle, it's different. But yeah. I was going to ask. So do you them, do you feed them? You give them live, or you give them? No, I give them frozen, frozen thawed, thawed or what? Yeah, really. Frozen thawed. And they mm -hmm. take it. They take it that that easily. Usually they'll take it the first time. The trick that I found with them is because um, I quarantine them outside. That was when stuff you know started changing wow. for me in 2021. I started quarantining them. I do the first stage outside, mm. so they have you know really high humidity, really warm ambient temperatures. Like um, um, oh, actually, I say I should clarify this. They're not outside in the sun. They're in a separate building, but that building is completely. It's just all natural heat. 
Um, so it's just, you know, the natural Florida sun that heats everything up. So the first, you know, night that they arrive after I've done the initial soaking of them, which I know that's a bit controversial as well, but I always just soak them like I would do any other snake. Um, you know, I soak them for a few hours in a really shallow bit of water. Um, and I do the, the mite treatment and then I'll try later that night. Like I said, unless it's in shed, then I'll wait till it sheds. But I just, um, you know, I'll put them in, a, I have them in a tub. I get the tub latches off to where I can just pop the lid off. And I just try like a ninja approach to that shit. I go in at night with a long, you know, long, um, tongs and just pop the top and just put it right in front of them where they don't have a lot of time to kind of think, you know, they're, and they don't, the, the big key is don't let them focus in on me. Once they yeah. focus in on me, it's over. Good chance they're not going to eat. They're just going to yeah. be in defensive mode. And is it, is it put them like heated up or what? Yep. Yeah. Just yeah. heated up. Just I'm like ready, I feed baby. any of the, I just, you just, uh, yeah, I just stopped treating them like they're like, you know, glass snakes. Basically I started just offering them food. Like I would feed any of the others. And the majority You're of the time hearty, they dude. take it. I've had a couple that were a little, a little finicky, but you know, um, one that was super finicky that ended up, the, the secret was it just wanted nothing to do with rats or mice. It wanted gerbils. And as soon as I gave it gerbils, it's boom, every time. It'll like refuse a, a, a rat. And then you could literally just put the rat out of the way, put a gerbil in front of it. Boom. It's it immediately. So, but I mean, the, the majority of them, it's all just been standard rats or mice, depending on the size of the snake. And, like I said, I just, if it's big enough to eat a medium, it gets a medium or a large. And, yeah. and, you know, I've, I've, to me, that's just the way that, uh, you know, I figure with the, with regards to the diet of the rats, you know, uh, this should be impacting, I mean, certainly a guy like Ed should be having it, you know, if it was a genetic thing where they're all. Um, you know, have a, a some kind of genetic sensitivity to it, then I would think this would be in all of our collections. So one of the things I've heard, shout out to Gary Shavino, um, but Gary was at Keith McPeak's house. Um, maybe it wasn't at Keith's house, but he was talking about Keith McPeak and his success with Northerns and that Keith just has a way to like give them that one big meal at that right perfect time <coughs> that, that pushes them into that ovulation mode. Um, and I, you know, shout out to Warren Booth, man. Warren Booth was helping me out to the T as far as, you know, taking, taking her off food and then getting her back on small mm -hmm. meals, big meals. Like I, I have it all written down. And then when he told me, Hey, hit her with the big meal this time, mm -hmm. it was a fucking jumbo rat, man. This was a, this was bigger than a large rat. I hit her with a jumbo rat to where I was kind of like, Holy shit. I kind of was concerned. I was like, sure, oh, sure. God, I was like, she looks fucking jumongous. And even to, I'm like, she's going to regurge this. Like I was I even had that thought because how big she fucking looked. And it took her like a good week to digest this rat, man. Like she was gigantic. Mm -hmm. But then sure enough, that was that one meal. That was the last meal. And it and she went all through the motions right after that. And sure enough, she ovulated. So I that always stood out stood out to me as far as like, you know, man, that feeding thing has to be it. Like, and 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 you know, think about people who like have not had success with other species of reptiles. Like, I mean, oh hey, shit, you can talk about this right now, Ryan. You just recently had a pop one olive, uh, or I don't want to call it pop one olive, but you had a pop one python um, clutch recently, right? Yeah. Uh, I've heard with those, it, it it comes down to the exact same thing, feeding it at the right time and whatnot. Um, what was your success with that? You feel like did did the feeding thing help, or I'm curious where you feel like you got the success with with the pop ones this year? Um, I mean, I'm a firm believer in the food thing, and the uh, the well timed big meal works across the python spectrum in a lot of cases to breed them um but as far as this particular poplin female um i did feed her more during the you know the cycling period um i was feeding a little bit bigger meals not nothing crazy different um and she refused food i think about 21 days before she ovulated um and then i mean i have another poplin female that four years in a row she gets huge follicles stops eating sits upside down for two months and then reabsorbs so if i you know if i knew if she, if i could give her that last meal and knew that was going to be the last time she would take one then maybe that would help that female but it just uh i haven't i haven't quite got it figured out with that one yet 
Hit it with a pig or something, bro. Just fucking throw some. <laughs> I've, given them, I've given them rabbits. There's a lady that gives me rabbits every couple weeks. So like those big New Zealand ones, like those big fuckers, like they're like no. <laughs> unfortunately, these are like show bunnies with long hair. I really oh, hate. Them. They sucks. all have long hair. It really sucks. But so. you're all feeding off designer fucking bunnies. Like oh yeah, they're they're fancy bunnies. Like that they didn't get the look that she wanted, so they're cold. Take them. You know? Damn. So they're alive. Yeah, my my dad is friends with her, and he picks them up and brings them over, and then I put them in the freezer. Oh damn! God bless. Even with all that fur. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. I, I I'm like, man, why can't she breed like Dutch rabbits or something with some, you know some hairless hair. rabbits? Yeah, they're all these lion head, giant, furry. They always look huge. I'm like, man, these things are monsters. And then you like, oh wait, they're only it's all hair, half a pound because it's all fluff. fluff. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, my biggest thing though, kind of getting back to the talk of the, <coughs> I, I, I would like to confidently think one day if an emerald regurges, it's not the end of the world. Right. But in mm. my world, if I see an emerald regurge, that's a big, big fucking problem to me. Um, now mind you the situation, if this has been an emerald, that's been solid the entire time I've had it and it's been four or five years. You know, maybe look at the surroundings, look at the heat, make sure it wasn't anything like what the temperatures that made it good. Because there is that there's that one off situation where you gave it a big meal, didn't get enough heat or something, and it puked it up, right? So there is case by case, but for the most part, let's be real. If an emerald pukes on you, especially if it's a new arrival, though that's the scariest scenario there. A new arrival pukes on you, more likely, if not likely, it's over. I I, I have not seen a I mean, scenario. Yeah. I have not That's seen a scenario. I have not seen a scenario of anyone saying, "Yeah, you know what? This thing regurged for me, like, you know, back to back to back, and then now it doesn't regurge, um, and now it's breeding for me. It's doing great, or it's you know, it's alive and doing great." No, dude, I've, there's been no facts of that yet at all. Um, the only stuff I've heard was I know Harlan Wall was trying to do like a pro a probiotic treatment. I think we talked about that, like uh, a probiotic treatment for the ones that were puking. But as far as I'm aware, that's not been a long-term solution. So, um, yeah, anything I've ever heard about it was always anecdotal, and there was never seemed to be any any proof of them surviving more than you know six months to a year. Yeah, Every and that's a hundred, a hundred percent, hundred percent of them. Not as, as far as as far as, as you all know. I've ever heard of. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's why, like I said, that's why I was I, I passed. I, I mean. I have passed on way more good looking emeralds than I've bought. Yeah. Because I've I've seen plenty of them where I looked at them and I'm like, nope. I, I was I went to, to pick out from a shipment one time and every single animal in there, there was a couple nice ones, but I, I didn't end up buying a single one. Cause I was yeah. like, what are you looking at? Like what are you looking for? Um, well it's you, you know, the body tone is obviously, you know, head. important. Like you, yeah, the head is important, but you know, the body tone and the I, I think the way the animal responds as well will give you an idea. Talk it's a lot of subtle stuff, and yeah. it's not like it's a 100%, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, you can sit there and pick out every single one that's sick. But I just didn't want to take the risk. If they showed any signs of like, well, that one looks a little funky, you know, it's not really acting right. And and I don't know if this is definitely a thing, but I feel like when, they, when they're looking and they're kind of like acting like they're either going to strike – or they're maybe even interested in food, but they they give almost like a nauseous looking response, where they look like they're kind of like like they just almost looks like there's in, you know some kind of pain in their in their stomach or something. To me, that looks like it could be something, and I've seen a lot of those in those shipments where it's like that thing just doesn't look right, you know. But it's it's yeah. fairly subtle, and it's it's also kind of in the eyes as well. They just yeah. look, you know. It's a it's kind of a shitty skill to have, but from working at an importer back in the day, you've seen enough sick stuff to where you kind of learn, you know. And, and I think that's where genius. the eye the train the, the eye training comes in. Like when you have so many visual experiences from emeralds, like like you know when a good emerald looks. Well, just like. a lot of different and a lot of different species, not just emeralds, but right. just tons of different stuff. You know, you've seen seen enough of it, and you kind of know. But we're talking about what you're de- we're, we're talking about what you're passionate about to, to this day, like yeah, something yeah, that yeah. you still obsess over because it's in your room, right? Mm-hmm. These emeralds, right? And and we know when they're perched, the way they look when they're in perfect condition, like they're mm-hmm. not fat, but they're a full looking snake, you know. Mm-hmm. And then you see one that you know should have a lot more fat on it, but it doesn't. 
Like you mm-hmm. can tell a, like a sickling looking emerald when you see one pretty fucking easily once you've seen a bunch of good looking emeralds. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but all all the wild caught ones don't come in looking looking crappy like that. Mm-mm. It's, it's no, I mean, no, no, some of them come really good, man. Like it's it's so, it's a huge coin flip, but it's some of them come in tits, like like not bad looking at all. I posted uh, a couple weeks ago. I posted that snake right there, that anaconda face female. Um, two days after I got her, and she, uh, you know, she had just got the. She was in shed when she came in, so she had a little bit of like just kind of a messed up couple pieces. But she, you know, that shed came off really easily. You know, I hydrated her, and you know, two days afterwards, she looked. You, you would think she was a captive bred animal. Yeah. You know, but that's not not a lot of them come in looking that good. But there are some that come in looking that looking that good, and that's the ones I always tried to pick. You know, I just that was kind of my rule from the get go. Was like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to buy a bunch of them at once because then if if there's something going around, then I'm losing all of them. And Do you so have any idea from like? From talking to importers, like how long it, like what, how long the 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 journey is from picking them off a tree to you getting them. I don't know. I mean, that's going to vary because I think it's going to depend on where you know the original trappers. You know, I, I don't know that that's going to be so variable. I would think most cases it's anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, but probably not more than a month or two in a lot of cases. But you know, the and and the thing is, you know, they're if they're even if they go several months without feeding if they're not sick they're not going to be wasting away losing weight you know they're not going to rapidly lose weight like that just in the course of two or three months unless they got something going on just saying though man when you when you are obsessing over these things and you keep them and you have healthy ones your mind starts to go into gear mode once you start seeing one that doesn't look right you know Mm -hmm. um and usually those signs always lead to something and it's not it bounced back and it's doing great. <laughs> it's just- well, yeah, and, and you know the thing, I've I've been really pretty hardcore about them to where I, I get I get paranoid if they don't eat the first try. Uh, I don't like it if they don't eat the first try. I mean that's that's just being honest. I, if they if it won't eat for me the first or second try, I'm immediately like, hmm, you know what's going on with this one. And I've only lost a few of them, and it was they were you know they they showed signs immediately like that. They just were really hesitant feeders. They didn't uh, you know they didn't have a good feed, feed response, and so you know. But that's not to say that every one of them that's hesitant or, or picky is guaranteed sick and guaranteed is going to crash because that's not the case. You know, I had a female, like I said, that female that w- that didn't want anything to do with rats or mice. I tried every single one of the usual techniques. Nothing worked. And then finally she kicked in when I offered her a gerbil. And then it's like, you know, slamming meals, gaining weight. Everything looks good. Did you ever, were you ever able to switch it or is it still just gerbils? I've just been feeding her gerbils just because she'll take it. Uh, every, every other meeting or every other meeting, every other meal I'll offer a rat, but she just snubs it. So mm-hmm. I haven't bothered to try to, you know, switch her over to them yet, but I will. But if you can get some pretty, pretty decent size um gerbil so it's it's worked out fine and as long as she's eating that's that's my concern i don't think i could get gerbils to be honest <laughs> that's like that you tried be- hamsters i did and she didn't want them oh wow so i've tried I tried chicks i tried hamsters i tried quail i tried rats mice i, I didn't try an asf with her which maybe well, she i was gonna say that her. might be there you go yeah i didn't try an asf but um but yeah, I mean the gerbil she went through. But I remember back in the day that was what we used to do with with ball pythons, the adult imports. You know, they gerbils, yeah, yep. gerbils and Siberian dwarf hamsters were were you know pretty much just as good. I don't I don't know where to get those you know right now. Uh, I don't have any local sources for that. But you know, I remember that's my first ball python didn't eat for damn near a year, and um, then I you know somebody said to try a gerbil, and sure enough, she went for him. So, and that seemed to be pretty consistent back then. Yeah. It's crazy how it takes like one certain type of rodent for this thing to eat, but then they kind of, you know, certain personalities of snakes only like to stick to that one thing. Um, but it's not common though. Cause usually once they get eating, they'll fucking start eating almost anything that you want to toss at them. Um, yeah. They, it's, it's kind of like the babies, you know, usually they'll, they'll switch to something. I just haven't bothered with that female yet. I need to just try to switch her over, but that's an interesting topic with, you know, prey preference with certain individual snakes, because I know I've talked to a few different people that breed emeralds, and um, I've got a couple of the, the juveniles that I've produced that 
they only want live. They re- like they are absolute sticklers for live, and I wish I understood exactly what that is. Now I I haven't pushed them that hard to try to switch them to Frozen Thought either, but it's like they you know they really really only respond to a live. Uh, I've noticed a general preference in my maybe it's because I've always fed them rats, but here lately I've been trying to give my you know two two. Two and a half, three year olds, uh, jumbo mice instead of a, a small, uh, small rat. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they'll start eating it and they'll just spit it out, leave it mm-hmm. on the, leave it on the floor of the cage. Weird. I don't know again if that's because they, you know, I've always fed them rats and they're just, it's just something different. That, um, I think that, Marshall, you, that, that might be it because, you know, with all this, you know, jumbo mice preference when it comes to feeding, I was like, well, this time of year, let me let me not give them rats. Let me kind of slow, do, you know, give them smaller meals. And I gotta tell you, man, more than half my chondros, they wrap that shit and they spit that shit out and they don't eat it. And I'm like, Fuck. oh, you're talking about chondros? And and actually, and emeralds. I want to say both of them. They they both, not all of them. Some of them will just eat it. You know what I mean? But I have some where I have to go check because they'll just drop it and they they and and they never used to do that with rats. Um, so I haven't noticed it with chondros much, but definitely the emeralds. Yeah, I'm I'm noticing it with both, actually more with chondros than I am with emeralds, to be honest. Really? Hmm. Yeah, but these are my BAC girls though, too, my big girls. Like, so I think these girls are like, yo, give me something fucking real to eat, not this goddamn mouse. You know what I mean? Um, and that's why I feel like Patrick's a huge believer on why, like, okay, like I say what you want about size, you know, you know, rodent preference for a chondro, but he feels like BX are that size, that big fucking chondro that does do better off on rats than it does mice. Um so I don't know if that could be the case too. I don't know. We'll see. It's interesting. I, 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 you know, most of the snakes that I have that are, are that are still pretty picky about, uh, you know, whatever prey at them is, is just really all the juveniles. You know what I mean? And it's, it's normally once they're past it, the year or two year old phase, um, they'll eat whatever I give them. But I mean, they still you can you can tell even the way they'll respond. You know, some of them have a clear preference for rats over mice or vice versa. You know, um, Uno, which is one of my favorite, um, probably my favorite emerald I've produced so far. Um, he's finally like excited when I give him a rat. <laughs> it took like he'll because he he you know, he needs to be on rats, but you know I was giving him mice and he, it's like mice he's slamming immediately. And it took a while with the rats he'd eat it, but he was always it kind of you know looked like unenthusiastic about the rat but he would eat uh, but now he's switching over to where he has the same kind of enthusiastic response so i wish i understood what that was you know and um if there's anything you can do about it or if it's just you know you just got to deal with them they're individuals and you know there's not too much you can do about their, their preferences so i gotta ask you with that pairing behind you right now right mm-hmm. how is how is that male and female being fed like how frequent, like when, when it comes to them being already paired up and mm-hmm. you see locks and they're both eating still, like what's, what's your, what's your game plan when it comes to feeding them while they're paired? So the males, I basically just feed a few times while they're throughout their, them being paired. So I feed them about every six to eight weeks okay. and I just give them a normal size meal. So he's a little bit bigger of a male. Okay, looks I don't good. know if he's really, he's like, yeah. I don't know how clear it's showing up in there. No, looks, he's, looks good. I can see it. Yeah. He eats mediums normally. So I just give him a medium. Um, maybe a small occasion. It just depends on what I have. Usually I'll just give them a medium rat and then she takes either a big medium or a large. Um, last time I fed her was actually a jumbo. So how long ago? Uh, rat, a jumbo rat? Yeah. Oh, wow. So it was about, I think it's been about 10 days, maybe oh, two wow. weeks, something like that. Okay. So, and I just feed, you know, at, at that, at that, at this stage of breeding, cause they've been breeding, they started, um, becoming active a little bit later than the other two pairs. Mm-hmm. So I think they started like maybe two months, <coughs> two months later, and she had I don't know if that's her natural cycle or not that she's just always going to go later. But she when she had her litter, it was like if you remember, it was like I think December twenty third in twenty twenty two. So I mean, she didn't ovulate until June or July. Mm. Um, so she's you know on a little bit later of a cycle it seems. You separate um, them to feed them or feed them the yeah, same yeah. I always separate to feed. I don't know why I still continue to play that fucking game. Um, I, maybe because I'm just in a hurry sometimes, and it's kind of a pain. In the I ass. get it. it could, I could see where it could be convenient, but yeah, I just I don't no, take the risk not, anymore. No, because if I do it, I have to sit there. Like that's the thing. Like I have yeah. to fucking, I you have to babysit monitor. it the whole time, which doesn't do me any good either. So that's why with I'm emeralds too. Like I would be just because of the size of their teeth, man. I mean, any yeah, you know, 
fucking it's bad. such a difference. Like, if I, I thank fuck I haven't had any Emerald fights, I'm dreading the day that it inevitably. Oh, I don't happens. want to, I don't want that day, bro. Oh, uh, oh, you know, oh. I've talked with that about it, and it's they and I and I've you know my friend Jake had it happen with um one of two I think two pairings. Oh shit! And so you know, even with a even with a fairly mild you know altercation, you're looking at severe you know lacerations on the animals. So. Or, or and they yourself. hit hard too, man. They they strike hard. A they big do when emerald? they're when they're yeah. I've only taken one bite from an adult female that meant it, and it's worst snake bite I've ever taken as far as just you know pain and long lasting pain. You know, I've taken bites from significantly larger snakes than that that didn't hurt as bad or last. More I've never been bit by an adult. Knock on wood. It's not fun, and I, and it wasn't even the worst. I mean, it was mostly just right on my knuckle that the worst of it was. But you know, imagine taking a bite like that to the face, it, or to uh, the like to the hand, like fingertips. Oh, Mark Bailey, Mark <laughs> Bailey's girlfriend took got, she got like thirteen stitches or something from an adult, like right here on her right here on her fore, like on the inside mm-hmm. of her meat on her forearm from, yeah, from an emerald, an emerald. Yeah. <coughs> oh wow! I'll show you pictures. He sent me pictures. It's pretty gnarly. It's one of those things too, you know, like people, I, I see people a lot, you know, cause, and I, I do handle my emeralds occasionally and I'll, I'll post videos of me handling them and I, I'm not scared of them or anything. I don't, I don't handle them very often at all, but you know, I'm not afraid to take them out and handle them occasionally, yeah. but I definitely know, you know, it's like, there's a huge difference between a little, you know, Nick, a, kind of a, def- a defensive bite Versus a like a fuck you bite or a feed response, huge difference. And there's a lot of people I think that are out there, you know, that will say like, oh, you know, there's nothing to be afraid of from them. And you know, oh, I took a bite and it wasn't that bad. It's like okay, but that's kind of like saying, you know, I was in a car and I got a little tiny, you know, somebody bumped my fender from behind, and that's right. the exact same thing as a head-on collision at 80 miles per hour. It's two yeah. different, very different things. You know what I mean? So. You yeah, gotta... it, it, it might. I mean, come on, guys. Let's, let's, let's think about how psychotic these things act when they fucking wrap around a fucking rodent. Sometimes, like these, I don't understand it's the nasty, whole nasty man. They, they they drop it and they'll like wrap, hit the floor, and then wrap back up, and then hit the floor, tumble with it, and like it's like kind of fucking crazy. And so I can only imagine if they bite you like that, it ain't gonna be good. You know what I'm saying? They, nah, they, I wouldn't. They're bite of death. Like they don't want to let go. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. The difference between like a little, you know, a little kind of warning bite versus a a, a serious, you know, a serious bite is are just a world of difference in my opinion. And um, yeah, I wouldn't want to. I, I you know I try to be respectful of them, and you know, you got to watch out when you're feeding them for sure. And that that's why I don't, you know, I don't even attempt to feed them when they're in the same cage. I don't do it with chondros either, but I definitely wouldn't want to do it with the emeralds just because an accident either involving me or the snakes is pretty risky i don't even like well i don't even like messing with my emeralds at nighttime like when the lights are out they're fucking a whole nother snake bro like they they're they're ready to rock and roll you know and same yeah. with the chondros too you know but I, I i'm a firm believer where interactions with me and any of my snakes is in the daytime you know I'm, I, I prefer a daytime session with them all sure. day every day versus nighttime um and I'm glad I'm not like at that stage where a bunch of people come over to my house to hang out because I could definitely be like, hey, let's go to my room and check everything out. Motherfuckers are getting bit. You know what I'm saying? If that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, but yeah, yeah you, you got to watch out. Be careful, bro. Like it's, she's it's not changed like- in her behavior, too. She used to be really docile and she's pretty good most of the time, like if it's during the daytime. But she's definitely one of those snakes that has a it's a Jekyll and Hyde thing between day and night. I can't. I used to be able to. I used to be able to deal with her at night if I wanted to take her out or if I, you know, w- w- needed to take her out for a, a full clean of the cage or something. Um, right. But now she whips around like, you know, basically looks at me like, try it. Come on in. Yeah. You know, see, but, see but, what happens. So I'm like, think, all right, I'm going to push you. That you. But do you think that could be a spike of her like kind of going through the motions? And she's I think like, it's mostly a food response. Yeah, I don't think it's like it's not really like um, significant defensive or aggressive behavior. But, yeah. you know, I don't. I just don't push her when she's, you know, if she's acting like that. I'm like, all right, I respect it. I mean, I mean, Ryan I do not. most of my ma- most of my maintenance at, at night, and I gotta keep. I use the roll of paper towels. Just <laughs> I to, do just to like keep them, you know, keep, I keep change... that between them and my hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah, I'm I... reaching in to change the water or you know whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's why I like having the drawers to just be able to pull that out if I'm doing, you know, doing stuff. I and I do. I will change waters at night and stuff, but. 
the drawers definitely makes it easy. I want to, I want to eventually out have technique. all of them in that. I need to talk to Focus Cube about that because that would be so like just epic to roll that out and just maintenance uh, uh, an enclosure like that where you don't have to open up the uh, window. Because also, if especially if they're breeding, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, exactly. It minimizes any kind of stress, the airflow, or like, you know, any kind of like disturbance, I feel like, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got some old school freedom breeder display cages, and they have yeah. the pull out pull out tray. Yeah, those are pretty wow. cool. Those it's I, nice. Those are I, I've tried to find those somewhere, and those seems like they didn't. Maybe they didn't build those for very long or something. You never uh, see. Them I don't think sale they or, did. Or, but I can't, they, it's hard to even find uh, a picture of them. You know what I mean? Even what's behind yeah. you, Chris? Like even what's mm -hmm. behind you? You can't find those, can you? No, there's um there's a company that I don't know if they're still around that makes a smaller version like kind of like that. Right. But it's it's a little smaller. Um, but yeah, these are the old school, you know, these are the same kind of ones that like, uh, Ed and Tony and those guys. Remind me the size the of, what are the size of those cubes? Right <coughs> those are 24 inch cubes, which that's the only thing I don't like about them is they're too small. So, but I'm, I'm going to be changing up, you know, depending on what route I go. Um, if I decide to, to follow through with my original plan of keeping them outdoors, like outdoors, outdoors. Then I'll probably, you know, switch to to outside caging, and these will just be for, you know, I'll still make use of them. But um, but if I decide to switch up my plan and kind of go more along the lines of what I'm doing in the back room there, um, then I'll probably have to go with custom design cages. I've been but I definitely want the pullout tray with that because it's just so convenient. I've been obsessed with that style of cages ever since I saw Ed's room. Like ever since I saw Ed have those, I'm like, what are those? And I just something about seeing through on all. <coughs> yeah yeah that's pretty cool yeah and they they you know that was my thing i saw uh good old craigslist man i saw uh the the ad for those um come to have email alerts that, for a bunch of different stuff and so i got an alert for that and i'm like you know usually i see different cages pop up and i'm like i don't that's all crap i don't want any of that but i saw that i saw that ad and i'm like holy shit that's those old acrylic cages and so I met the guy up and I bought, you know, the, as many as he would give me, which was just four at the time. He kept two for himself. But it was an interesting experience, too, because he there was a little bit of emerald history because he actually sold some snakes to Ed and Tony back in the day. Damn. And so he had bred emeralds himself. You know, he had um, some nice northerns and I think a few basins as well. So it was cool talking with him. And Who, who was it? Uh, it was Dave Toro. I think I mentioned that on oh, the yeah. thing with Alan. He that said name. that name sounded familiar. Ed, yeah. Ed said the name sounded familiar as well. And um, cause I told, you know, when I went up and met with him, I was like, yeah, I drove a few hours to, to pick him up. And, um, I told him I was keeping emeralds and he was getting excited about that too. But he, I think he ended up moving out of state the last time I texted him. Cause I was trying to, every now and again, I text him. I'm like, you ready to let any more of those cages go? <laughs> cause he kept a couple condros in them. Um, but yeah, he was, he seemed like he was getting, wanting to get into emeralds again or something, but I think it just, maybe it was a phase. So, um. But yeah, it's kind of cool. They got maybe a little bit of emerald history there, as far as the. Uh... I mean, ever since I came out with like, I think it all started with you know when Jessica Alba died, my 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 Miss Willie line. Mm -hmm. I put out I put out the information that she passed away, and then instantly someone who owned her before it went to Forest hit me up and gave me all this information on it. His name was Norm Norm Norman. His name was yeah Norman. yeah. He sent me a couple of messages. Yeah, he seems like a really nice cool guy. guy. But I was like, I had no idea, you know. And so he gave me all this info, and then. Miss, and then when, when my Miss Will, my other Miss Willie ovulated, and I put that out, the other guy who owned this one hit me up and gave me all the details on her. And I'm like, nice. dude, I, that's fucking pretty cool. That like, I mean, who like, these guys are still around and they still care in a sense. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Um, and, th and I just think that there's deep, really like history that people care about when it comes to the emeralds. Um, and you know, I, I love them, man. I, I don't know why they're not worked with as much as they should be, but I'm also happy with that too because it gives us opportunity to make the make them grow and whatnot. You know, as far as popularity and and being kept more often in the hobby. I think the big reason is because it was always the regurge issue. You know what I mean? I mean that was yeah, a thing that sure. was always an issue. I remember when I worked at the wholesaler, and not just the emeralds, but you know some of the red tail bows that were coming in. Same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. They were just, they were just, it was always because you can't move forward from it. Once you get that regurge, it's over. You don't have, <coughs> you don't have breeding success after the, that. It's over. Seems to be the case. Yeah. 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 And it sucks. Trust me. And I only say this because I have a freezer to prove it. I, I do have a freezer of like 2017 to 2020 of me just getting in shit, puking, and it's over after that. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, 
But listen, wrap up question time, and I'm gonna go first, and then Ryan or Marshall go after me. Um, and this is gonna be real, <laughs> real simple, Chris. Uh, straight to the point. Yeah. Anyone out there who just got their first emerald or is new to keeping emeralds, and they have a new uh, new arrival that pukes on them, what should they do? Well, I would have it euthanized. That would be my recommendation. If it was, if you're looking, for, if if it was like cut and dry, that's that's what I think is going to end up saving you the most heartache in the long run. Uh, yeah. But I would I would add to that. I would say it really just depends. You, you need more specifics. You know, is there a, a likely environmental trigger or a likely conditional trigger that may have caused it that you know doesn't suggest that it's got an internal illness? You know, did you did it eat a big meal and you were handling it? Were you rough with it? Did it experience a spike? or, you know, really strong dip in temperature, something that could create a one-off situation. Um, but if there wasn't anything like that, I would be like, yeah. You know. <laughs> what a dark wrap-up question. I'm sorry. Uh <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We could, we could lighten things up a little bit if you want. <laughs> All right, who wants to go next? <laughs> Ryan, go for it. Go ahead, Ryan. Do you uh, keep any of the other Corallis or just uh, emeralds? Just emeralds for now. I love ATBs. I would love to get some of those again at some point. Um, I, I used to love those when, when I worked with a wholesaler and you know, have a big, tall screen cage full of them and dodging those slow strikes was fun. Man, I was hoping you were uh, going to say you had some Cropani hidden over there. but I mean, that would be incredible, but yeah, I, don't, I, I can't. That's pretty much non-existent, right? And there are only one or two yeah, of them they found. That'd be amazing. Beast. But yeah, and I, I don't have basins yet, but I, I, I want to get basins at some point. And, um, oh, yeah. But I've just been focusing on the Northerns, you know. For Good the for you. The Northerns are uh, plenty neat enough. The, <coughs> the basins aren't, you know, some crazy special thing. <laughs> well, I love them both. I mean, I, I, I love them a lot, but I figured, you know, when I started, started with this project in 2019, I figured that, you know, I had a. a decent somewhat unique skill set and having the previous experience working at a wholesaler and dealing with stuff before and the you know i guess being a glutton for punishment in that sense and i'd I'd take the risk and try to make it happen so it seems like it's working out slowly over time and um yeah hopefully that just uh continues but uh, we didn't really get to go into it we don't have to do it i guess we can maybe do it another time but i did want to talk a little bit more about the some of the more specifics with the humidity and spraying and all that. Well, I mean, go ahead, bro. Before we get to Marshall's, why don't you give us a little bit more on that before we get to Marshall's wrap up? Yeah. So, so one of the things with that, so like I said, for the record, I'm not anti-spraying, but I stopped spraying altogether. Um, and I mean, altogether, you know, about two and a half, three years ago. So I basically just, you know, seeing guys like Michael Cermak, um, who's Australian chondro breeder, who, you know, he, he said with his chondros, he didn't spray them at all. He kept them in outdoor cages, and then even the babies, he didn't spray them at all. But he's always, you know, dealing with 80 percentish you know, relative humidity that he keeps them in. So I was like, all right, you know, kept moving more and more in that direction and then basically spraying less to try to, mostly to try to see, you know, are the are the raindrops, you know, is the, the, the spraying them really as crucial and really the triggers that everybody says they are? You know, is this really, you know, as, as crucial as everybody says? And I mean, at this point now I've, you know, succeeded in breeding them, you know, establishing, you know, however many wild cots now with no misting whatsoever, not from day one, all the way through breeding them, producing the babies, raising the babies up, never spraying any of them. And I'm pretty convinced that it's not that spraying them is terrible, um, but I just, I'm not convinced that it's the, the magic bullet that it's kind of gets portrayed to be. And I'm actually leaning more and more towards, um, the idea that it's probably similar to what the chameleon guys have realized that they're likely inhaling fine particles of water from the high humid air and getting hydrated that way more than we realize they are. Um, there's a really interesting a couple of podcasts out there in the Chameleon Academy with a guy named Peter uh, Peter Nachos, or, or I think that's yeah, Peter Nachos, I believe was his name, and he they did a study on chameleons, and he realized after studying them for I believe decades, he had observed you know tons of you know basically every 
conceivable behavior of the animals, but he realized I've never seen them drink water, not once. Out of all these different countries I've gone to, never once have I observed these animals drink. But in captivity, they go crazy. You know, they're, everybody's using misters and, and droppers and everything, and the animals are drinking like crazy when the misters turn on or when they're sprayed. So why aren't they doing it in the wild? And so to try to shorten it up a little bit, they discovered that the, the chameleons are inhaling fine particles of water while they sleep at night during that dew period and during the fog. And that's actually their sole means of hydration as far as, you know, their, their standard means of hydration. Um, they will occasionally... How, how do they absorb? Do they know how, how it's absorbed? Is it like... The the I don't understand. I don't, I don't have a full. It's through the lungs. We well, we all. I think all vertebrates do it. So all of us can take in. Because um, he explained that you know nebulization for medications in humans is a very successful way of you know distributing medication to the cells, and so all, all vertebrates do this. Hmm. Um, but they didn't realize that the, that's what the chameleons are doing in the wild. Is they're actually it's a hundred percent of their hydration is coming through that fog period. And so he actually weighed the animals. Um, you know, at night, right before, I think like right before nightfall, you know, had these found wild ones in their locations, weighed them and then weighed them again, right before sunrise. And they were actually gaining weight despite they're not eating. And, you know, there's really no explanation for them gaining weight. Well, they realize what it is. They're inhaling the equivalent of about a, like if it was a human, they're inhaling about a liter's worth of water at night. Damn, a liter of cola? <laughs> no, I mean, it's not a full liter for them, but like relative to their body weight and stuff. And so it's got me thinking, you know, that's, I, I can't prove it. I'd like to take the time. I don't know if I will get around to do it. I'd like to try to do the same thing with the emerald babies and weigh them, you know, before and after the nightfall and just try to do some of those kind of experiments to see if it's the case. But it's like what I started noticing when I stopped spraying them was one of the reasons it got me to stop spraying was when I used to take them out back and, and, you know, point the hose up in the air and try to simulate rainfall, I noticed a lot of them didn't really give a shit about drinking after I had raised the relative humidity up high enough. They just didn't seem to be that interested. The one snake that would always drink was my Amara. And it's not a surprise because she was chronically dehydrated because I didn't know it at the time, but she had liver cancer. So she's having, you know, organ failure slowly occurring. So it makes sense that she'd be constantly drinking every time she got sprayed. But most of the other ones didn't really have a lot of interest in drinking. They might drink a little bit, but they weren't doing the behaviors that you see in other people's setups where as soon as they get sprayed or misted, they're guzzling like crazy. And after, you know, seeing that, I just stopped, stopped spraying more, you know, stopped spraying as much and eventually just stopped spraying altogether. And I've noticed that I just don't see anywhere near the level of desperate you know, somewhat desperate looking drinking behavior from any of the animals. Um, they'll sometimes drink if like I've done the thing with a cup of water, put it up to a gravid female's mouth just to see if she'll drink out of it. And sometimes they will, sometimes they won't, but they don't always, you know, immediately go straight down and start trying to guzzle water every time either when, when you put fresh water in. And I think it's just likely that, you know, if they're not kept at a proper high enough humidity, particularly at night, then they're not, you know, potentially not inhaling enough um, water particles and not being as hydrated as they properly, sh you know, properly should. And so it'd be interesting yeah. to see if there is a direct parallel there, if it's something that, it, you know, if it's affecting them, I would imagine it's, it's affecting probably, you know, most reptiles from human climates. Yeah, I can are say you, are my pythons are... What was that? I, most of my pythons are much happier at higher ambient humidity than yes these. yeah and wow, i think I'm particularly running. and see it just never until i saw that that those pockets with that guy it never it didn't really fully click in my head but listening to him explain everything it's like that actually all makes sense they're when they're not kept at a high enough humidity they're literally drying out so then they have to compensate you know when you spray them with the misters the reason they're drinking heavily it's not because they love necessarily love the rain again this is just my theory about it i, don't, I can't say 100 percent sure this is true but i think it's more likely that the reason they're they're so fast to drink and they'll drink so heavily is just because they're losing water when they should be you know gaining it at night yeah well even, even if they're not actually absorbing it mm -hmm. they're not they're not desiccating as fast 
just because the humidity, True. the ambient humidity is higher. Yeah, and he he had an interesting explanation too with regards to respiratory illness and spraying that I never really had put put together in my head until he explained it well, and that with with air and you know the the amount of water in the air the relative humidity what we tend to do a lot of a lot of the chameleon keepers were doing this and really it's a lot of what you see with our boreal snakes as well and a lot of reptiles in general we sometimes give them a kind of a reverse of what they would have in nature during the day we boost the humidity way way up sometimes to too high of levels and this is where I don't have a full understanding, so I might screw this up and try to remember what all he said. But the when when the air temperature is higher, it can't hold as much water um, as it can when it's lower, and so the air it actually starts ex the air is expelling larger water particles. Those larger water particles, if it absorbs too much um, water through breathing, if the animal does it actually can, can cause cells in their lungs to burst, which then leaves a bunch of decaying material in their lungs, which then leads to the respiratory infections. So I'm probably butchering some a lot of what he said there, so I don't know if it's a very clear inform, um, yeah, explanation. Yeah, no, warmer, but... warmer air holds more moisture than cold air. That's why dew point is a sliding scale. It, the, the hotter it is, the, the dew point goes way up. The colder it is, the dew point goes way down. But the grains per pound of water in the air doesn't change. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that explanation of the, you know, if the animals are absorbing too much, um, too much water that way, and it, you know, leading to the, the their cells to burst and then decaying and then that creating the grounds for the respiratory infection is was interesting because I always thought of it more in terms of like their external environment being wet and dirty was the primary cause of that yeah but, but um, you know what another thing though st that stood out for me when you kind of were breaking all this down a few months back or last year or something um like my room gets really dry bro like if i don't stay on top of my shit my room gets really dry mainly mm -hmm. because i have a huge garage door that opens up i have a back door that opens up i love letting air just come through my room like i like Especially San Diego. It's a like, tricky balance getting that airflow and then keeping yeah. the humidity right. And, and I notice I'll be in my room, I'll be doing chores and like in the in the zone, right, doing my thing, and I'll have all all this airflow go in. And I'll be like, God damn, it's twenty fucking, de it's twenty humidity in this room right now. Like, like before I opened up everything, it was like forty eight, fifty, and in a matter of minutes of opening up the doors, everything sucks out and it's dry again. Mm -hmm. And and then I go into like, well, now I got to spike everything back up. So. Mm -hmm. If I'm not on top of my humidity, meaning if I don't have my goddamn humidifier filled up with water and have and having that shit constantly on, dude, it's either super dry or it's super humidified in here. But yep. it doesn't stay consistent the way I want it. Like I struggle very, and I just mean ambient wise. I think in mm -hmm. here I got it down because I spray the fucking living shit out of the, the surroundings, mm -hmm. um, and I have a good way with substrate holding certain. So I, I get away with it in here, but my problem for me personally is my ambient humidity in this room. Uh, because mm -hmm. I could have it going perfect, and as soon as I crack a window or as soon as I open up a door, all that shit is gone. You know, yeah. um, so that's where I, that's my, you know, I don't live in Florida. That's my biggest struggle, and, and trust me, I'm not the only one who battles humidity issues. Oh yeah, I, I know I have a little bit of an advantage in, in in being in Florida in that sense, but at the same time, you know, inside the house is not it's not like it's crazy humid in here. Um, right. I think one of the things that you know, one of the things that helped me that I always do for the adult enclosures is just you got to find that balance between you know, large water sources that are constantly slowly evaporating and then finding the right balance for your room, your region um, with the ventilation, you know, which is always just takes trial and error of trying to find that sweet spot of where you can, you know, keep the air fresh, but still high enough humidity to where, you know, they're not drying out. Yeah. So. What's your ambient, Marshall? Humidity? Yeah. Uh, like probably, I mean, in the worst it gets in the, in the winter time, it's like 50, 60, 60% probably. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's probably higher than that now. Um, yeah, yeah you, don't, see, you, you know, don't have a lot of, you don't get a lot of stuck sheds and those, you don't get, a, you, it, does, it sounds like you don't get a lot of symptoms of dehydration. Only in the winter time, I, I get stuck sheds in the summertime, but you know, like what you were saying about finding the balance, I, 
I pretty much, you know, with almost all my cages now, have given them enough ventilation to where I pretty much keep the, the floor or the paper wet um, constantly. Yeah. I'll let it dry out, but it takes two or three days, and as soon as I notice it's dry, I'll soak it again. But, you know, the glass is never fogged up. I've got, you know, five fans running in here, uh, you know, trying to push airflow in every direction. And, I, you know, I think that's that's the that's the key is the ventilation, but also keeping it keeping it humid, but also well ventilated. Marshall, Good airflow. Have, Marshall, do you have something that sucks out the air in your room and replaces it with fresh air? Like, do you have that that exhaust system or something? Just like the opening and closing of the doors and then and the fact that it's not like a super tight, you know. It's not like a super like a, airtight super. room to begin with. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I looked into doing a heat recovery ventilator, but the high humidity in my snake room, I think it would probably just wreck the thing. Yeah, for sure. All yeah. the all the directions I read about them, um, they were like, if your humidity is too drastic from the outside to the inside, it'll condensate and wreck the machine. I was like, yeah, well, I got like 20% outside and 80% inside. That's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I say. So, Ryan, what do you your what would you say in a lot of your enclosures the the ambient humidity is? Um, when I built the new snake edition, uh, what in twenty seventeen or whatever, I spray foamed everything and I used uh, PVC wall panels mm -hmm. instead of drywall, and mm -hmm. I can keep I can easily maintain with just a small room humidifier. I can keep it. Uh, anywhere from like i think if it's real bad if it's like 68 and it's usually between 76 and 84 percent that seems to be pretty much the good sweet spot i think you know i that's what i try to aim for and i know like with ed i think ed if i remember correctly his room for his emeralds is i think he goes around 65 percent you know 65 70 percent something yeah, like i like that. it that best seems... at 82 84 percent yeah. that mm -hmm. seems to be they shed no matter, I yeah. mean, just like butter. So are you I mean, keeping yours over to water, what they, Chris? I keep all the juveniles and, and a couple of sub-adults over water, but I, all the adults, I just have a big, you know, really big water bowl. Uh, depending on the size of the, it's basically either one of these or two of those water bowls, depending on the size of the enclosure. And the you ones want that are about, a little larger have two. You want to talk about game-changing knowledge for a first-time emerald tree boa keeper, especially if it's a juvenile and you're struggling with humidity and like getting them to shed good, you put that thing over water, watch what happens. It's so easy. It's, it's, it's like, it's like night and day, dude. And mind you, you don't even need to put a lot of water. You don't need mm -hmm. to, I mean, and you don't because they'll drown themselves actually, it's crazy. Um, but it is nuts on how easy your life is when you're raising these things over water. And they, they shit perfect, they, everything is just a perfect world when it comes to them being over water. Well, that's what's been interesting with doing this. So, you know, I, I when I posted a stuff about it, and it was funny, uh, you know, you made a funny comment on the one guy that tried to come at me on the with a comment on the YouTube video saying like, "Oh, oh are you lazy?" <laughs> yeah, like people take that. Though they take the approach like, "Oh, it's a lazy approach. It's a bullshit lazy approach." It's like it's not about being lazy. It's about being effective. And like those snakes, you know, since I stopped spraying them, I keep them over the water. I could spray them too, and it would it, they'd still they would still do great. You know, it, it wouldn't matter. That's the my whole kind of feeling about this is that once you get the humidity correct and they have access to easy fresh water the spraying is not really that essential to them in my experience no. and it's not you know it's not a huge sample size but you know there's people out there that are really pushing this idea that uh, they've got to be sprayed non-stop and if they're not being misted they're unhappy and they're unhealthy and they're all this stuff but it's like well i mean i'm not working with nothing here i've produced 30 of them i've raised 30 babies now i've you know established about you know close to 20 adults or, or 20 wild caught ones nice same thing with the chondros so it's like it's i'm not coming with no numbers at all on this um i think it's an interesting idea i definitely would like to learn more about what's going on with the uh the study that that guy did with the chameleons and finding out how much of a parallel there is with you know lots of other reptiles but specifically i'm curious with what i've been doing keeping them over water and not spraying them is you know how much of their hydration that I that I kind of assumed you know I just kind of assumed that you know it's they they have easy access to clean water directly below them at all times and they have nice high humidity so they're not really losing uh, you know they're not drying out that way 
And you're not baking Maybe. them with giant heat panels. Oh, fuck. True. I'm, I'm not, it's true. I, the, well, that's one thing. With, with all of my enclosures, the heat's always on the outside of the enclosure. I don't have I call those things heat. bacon makers. Bacon <laughs> makers. <laughs> George Foreman grill. You know what's sad when I, if you've got them, you you have to compensate for that with the humidity because they. Yeah, it's more of a struggle. I think that's like I said. I'm not against yeah. them. I'm, I, that's, yeah, that's a I funny thing calling them bacon years, makers, but the bacon so maker comment. Like, you know. That bacon maker comment made me think back. I mean, it's it's. I'm laughing about it, but it was really a pretty sad thing to see at the time. But man, my first ball python. I had one of those stupid ass old heat rocks, big oh, red yeah. pink thing. Yep. And she just, you know, people think that they would get off of them. You know, oh, they're smart oh, enough. They won't stay on them. Cook. No, she literally could. I mean, it was like bacon looking belly scales. Yeah. And it took like three or four shed cycles before that was finally healed. Yeah. And I think even really several more after that before it even looked normal again. But that was an eye opener. Like, wow, that was a, you know, it's a terrible heat source. Yeah. <laughs> and they, I think they still sell those damn things today that, that are probably essentially the same. So a hot seller. <laughs> Nice. Hot's the keyword. Hot's the keyword. All right, listen. Uh, before we forget, let's get to the oh, wrap up question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, what's, your wrap, what's your wrap up question, Marshall? Um, so you you mentioned earlier that we talked a little bit about how long a you know snake could could be from finding it to making its way to you. So mm -hmm. is is the the theory that they're getting this whatever it is that's making them regurgitate? Is that something that's happening? in in between or, or are they doing this in the wild on it well that's a good question so they they definitely some of them arrive sick i mean they're they're you know they're not all catching it in the u.s i will say that probably a good portion of them that wouldn't need to get sick do get sick once they get here because of lack of quarantine and and you know, reusing nasty tubs from one shipment to the next and this kind of stuff. But um, they're definitely arriving sick. Whether they're all catching it at the holding facilities or they're actually sick in the wild, I don't know. Um, you know, there's uh, – I think I heard Amy Benzie make a comment in um, from one of the videos from their recent Suriname trip that they have seen – that they've been to areas where a lot of the emeralds that they found looked sick. So it's possible that they're, you know, contracting it in the wild and then they just get, you know, they probably, I'm sure it's probably just every single step they go through is increasing the length. Making it worse. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Because there's, there's just not, it's not either not feasible or just not being done to isolate them and, and quarantine them better. That's why I don't, I don't understand why people don't think that animals don't get sick in the wild. Like there is a big possibility that. Oh yeah, they definitely do. Sure. Up, they're, they're getting it out there and they're bringing it in. Like sure, it, yeah, you're sure. gonna fucking ra like a rabid rabid fucking animal or something. Like it's it's a possible thing, you know. But sure, yeah. But, I think but, it's just I think it's just that you know, we because we have the capacity to do something about it. We can't control everything and fix every single situation, but. You know, basic quarantine protocols are pretty straightforward to do that can would reduce so many problems. I mean, that was when I worked at a wholesale, it was one of the things that frustrated the hell out of me working for the guy because it was like, why can't you understand this basic, even if you don't care enough about the animals, like why can't you understand the basic math of Business. investing a little bit in more caging and, and time and separating them is going to result in more living animals because you're not going to spread things around as much. You know, when you get a shipment of baby boas in, you put all of them in a big trough and they're all drinking the same water. And, you know, it's like, well, what the hell do you think is going to happen? That's like crypto soup right there. <laughs> <coughs> I, think, I think I got Nido myself here. I'm coughing. That, uh, spray bowl. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not my trusty uh, fake man. <laughs> you must be on a no grain diet. You haven't regurged yet. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> He's waiting till the filming's over, and I'm gonna be yeah. I'm gonna be, oh, why you suffering? I'm gonna be now. I've been sick for like three weeks, and, and I, I'm on antibiotics now. But yeah, the cough hasn't gone away yet. So I'm yeah, assuming right. it was probably the Rona. I didn't uh, have a positive Nido test, but 
Well, that's what I'm assuming. Well, people in Florida don't get tested, right? Isn't that like a thing? Like, I, 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 I did. I tested to oh, you did? see if I, – Oh, I, I did one of the self-tests when I first got sick and it was negative. And then when I went into the doctor the other day, it was it was also negative. But, I mean, it feels like when I had corona before a couple of years ago. So it's, it's, I'm assuming that's probably what it is. Well, well, you did a hell of a job tonight, man. I appreciate it so much. Um, Thanks, you know, man. Went by too quick. I, not like we won't see you again soon. You've been a huge, uh, you know, help when I needed it. When it comes to you co-hosting this segment, so I appreciate everything, man. Um, I really do. And uh, we had just shy of ninety people tapped in for tonight's show. Uh, so, what would you like to say to all of the support you got on on tonight's show, my man? Uh, just thanks to anybody who you know not only supports what I do but tolerates the sometimes weird bullshit I post um, <laughs> because I, like I know sometimes my sense of humor definitely is not appreciated. Um, I'm not trying to be hateful. I just, you know, I just post things that I think are funny. And, um, so if you like it, cool. If you don't like it and you tolerate it, that's cool too. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, listen, snake spirit on Instagram, please go give him a follow. (laughs) I've already said this before. That's where you're most active, right? Instagram is your place. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I I do. I'm on the Amazon basin, um, Emerald group as well on Facebook, but that's, that's about just those two. And I prefer Instagram. All right. Well, I like to keep people away from Facebook. Um, so, but thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. My bed, my Thanks, good buddy yo. right here, Chris Rice. Give it up. It's a wrap for Snake Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Is it All weird right, if I clap for awesome. myself? No, I mean I would go fucking go get go put some Vicks on your chest and get your humidity. Yeah. Up. Okay, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hey, go. I'm, I'm gonna go sit and get a fogger running. Is what I'm gonna do. There you go. All right, man. Watch out for the particles in the air. All right. Have a good night, man. <laughs> good night, y'all. Yeah. See you, Chris. Yeah, it's one of those episodes that you just keep going. I mean, that was fucking, it, was actually, it was actually getting better as we kept going, to be honest, because uh, this guy could just talk on some shit that I think all of us could ran on forever. I mean, it was a good episode. What do you guys think? Yeah, no, it was great. I agree. I learned a lot about, it, about it, imports. Yeah. I, I mean, didn't... You, you didn't realize they come in either – Pretty good or pretty good fucked or up? bad? No, okay. I didn't know. You thought they were just always fucked, huh? I mean, you know, I don't know what I thought. I just I don't have any experience with it, so it was, it was interesting to hear. Oh yeah, you've never once taken in an, an import emerald at all, Marshall? No, every, I've never had a wild caught snake. What? Wow. I mean, since <laughs> what that you're oh like? Oh my a god, my weird. whole fucking collection's wild caught shit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's impressive. <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, you know, that's all we had. But right. not since I started this collection. Everything's been cats or bread. Well, that explains why he's into designers. That's the only thing you can get, kept. Or- My guy. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, shit. I appreciate you guys so much. Ryan, thank you so much for coming in the clutch. You know, you- no, sure. Anytime, man. I, I, I have to give a, a, a ratio of Con- Condros being a topic on each episode to Bill because he does not want to waste his time unfortunately um and you came through in the clutch for this emerald episode and because it really was an emerald episode i want to say so i appreciate you so much and of course marshall always in the clutch on a tuesday night you're the man marshall appreciate you coming through uh but guys molecular reptiles on instagram red mountain herps on instagram we'll give them a follow and it's a wrap for these two you guys have a good night all right have a good night guys give it up have a good night have a good night guys peace out bro thank you peace all right, guys. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode, this All in the Tree Tuesday. One of my favorite days of the week for sure. Marshall Mendez, Ryan Young, never a miss when it comes to these guys being on the show. And appreciate all you guys for tapping in, man. 70 consistent viewers the entire time. You guys know where to be on a Tuesday night. Coolest reptile network in the world, and that's a fact. I will catch you guys here tomorrow. Well, not me, but you'll catch my boy, Stephen Cush, tomorrow for his segment, Cush's Corner, uh, episode six. Is he on episode six? Yeah, he's on episode six. Um, Dustin Graham, he's having on. They're going to be talking about herping in Arizona and a bunch of other cool stuff. Listen, Stephen Cush's podcast is on fire. Do not miss this guy's podcast tomorrow night. I'm telling you right now, he's killing it in the podcasting game. Big up and comer. And his segment has been getting nothing but great feedback. And uh, drop a comment if you like this episode. If you got something really out of tonight's episode, drop a comment in the comment section. And don't forget... Join the Trap Talk Patreon family tonight. Let's go. Join the If you want to get behind the scenes, if you want to get more out of what you see out of each episode, if you want to connect with over 200 trappers who really love the reptiles on a diverse level, 
This is the family to be a part of, man. The Trap Family, coolest reptile Patreon family in the world. And let's go. Have a good night. I'll catch you here tomorrow with Stephen Cush. And then Thursday night, Trap Talk with MJ. You guys know the deal, man. Like I said, coolest reptile network in the world. And that's a fact. Have a good night. And I'm out. Cheers.